Thank you, councillors. Please stand. Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make here today. Amen. We acknowledge this country and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as traditional custodians, their language, songs and dance. We pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. May we continue to peacefully walk together in respect and in caring for this country and one another. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open. Are there any apologies? Councillor Lennon. Mr Chair, I advise that uh, Councillor Murphy will be absent today and I move that he be granted a leave of absence from the meeting. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that Councillor Murphy be granted leave of absence from today's meeting. All in favour, please say aye. Or raise aye. your hands. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Confirmation of minutes, please. Point of order, Chair. Sorry, Councillor Street, point of order. Sorry, just as a heads up, I had my booster today. So um, if I do feel a bit sick, I might quietly leave later on, just as a courtesy to let you know. Thank you, Councillor Street. Um, confirmation of minutes, please. Mr Lennon. Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,669th meeting held on Tuesday, the 1st of February, 2022, be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the minutes, the 4,669th meeting of Council held on the 1st of February 2022 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Any opposed, please say no and raise your no. hand. The ayes have it. Our councillors, we did have public participants uh, uh, in the version one of today's agenda, but unfortunately they're ill today. So we move on to the next item on the agenda, which is question time. Councillor Adaman. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Last week, the Premier announced that it was time for workers to head back to the office and for students to return to the classroom. Could you please update the Chamber on how the Schrinner Council will be supporting this measure including what other initiatives the Queensland Government could be implementing to encourage people back to their offices. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Adam, and uh, through you, Mr Chair, for that question. Well, last week in question time in this Council meeting, uh, just a week ago, took the opportunity to talk about our support package for local business and community organisations. We know that more than 5,000 businesses will be benefiting from our a quarter of relief uh, that was announced uh, a couple of weeks back. And uh, we're keen to make sure that we continue to do what we can as a council to support that relief and recovery effort. Now, as uh, the question said, uh, the Premier and the Chief Health Officer have made it clear that uh, it's back to school, back to the office. Uh, and that is a good thing because it is exactly what uh, many struggling businesses need. They need people to be out and about and they've struggled with a uh, few very few customers in recent times, many businesses. Uh, one of the ways that we're uh, gearing up to support that recovery and to support people transitioning back out and about is to, for the rest of February, uh, provide free metered parking right across uh, the city, wherever there's meters. So that's not just in the CBD or the Valley, that's in 19 different suburbs that have any kind of parking meters at all. So every single council meter will be switched off for the rest of February providing free parking uh, in many of those areas where uh, business has been doing it tough uh, and this will help support people getting out and about again. In addition to this, we'll be uh, making discount, discounted parking available at our King George Square and Wickham Terrace car parks in the CBD uh, and we'll be providing a 50% discount on the normal uh, rate of parking during peak time. So uh, that's a significant saving and those uh, two initiatives linked together will help uh, save people money so that they can spend a few extra dollars at local businesses. Now, uh, I know that one of the things that uh, will also make a difference is to provide some fair relief for public transport to help 
get people back on public transport. And we've certainly done our part with uh, the lead up to Christmas, our, our free bus travel for six days in the lead up to Christmas. That was an initiative that was funded by council and uh, cost around a million dollars to provide six days of free travel. And we saw people coming out and using that. We saw foot traffic in the CBD increasing to around 88% of pre-COVID levels. And so people were in that period really getting out and about. Now, I have written once again to Minister Bailey to ask him to sit down with us to work out a, an initiative that we can work on together to provide uh, some kind of incentives for people to get back on public transport. It will be now the fourth time I have written to the state government in the last 12 months on this exact same issue. Unfortunately, at this point in time, all we've heard in response is crickets. Uh, and so obviously I'm going to continue pushing this because it's really important to get people back on public transport as well as uh, using our parking facility. So uh, this will be, I know, a boost to many local businesses and a boost for residents as well. Uh, saving to residents of around half a million dollars a week over that uh, next few weeks, uh, which will see at least $1.5 million put back into the pockets of residents so that they can spend it at a local business or a local shop uh, and support the economy. If To get an idea on the impact this, this will have, uh, in December, we saw an average of 14,000 metre transactions happening every day in December. And so that going forward can be 14,000 uh, free parking opportunities for the residents of Brisbane every day. Uh, so this will benefit a lot of people and most importantly, support the recovery of our economy. Uh, we've continued to do the heavy lifting when it comes to support in 2022. Uh, we're still hearing, uh, unfortunately, not much support from the state government at a time when it is really critical, uh, but certainly we all need to be working together to do our part we are certainly doing ours as a council uh, and it'd be good to see other levels of government stepping up to add to uh, the impetus that we're seeing. We know that as people do get out and about, um, that will be good for local businesses. Uh, and, you know, there are so many businesses that have been telling me that they're not sure how much longer they can survive when their customers are staying away. So getting people out uh, can't happen soon enough. Uh, and that's why we're in introducing this free parking initiative for the month of February. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What about the federal government? Thank as you, well? Lord Mayor. Yeah. Further, yeah. further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. My question uh, is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, last year, Labor councillors tabled the initial draft plan for the Mowbray Park vision in this chamber. That plan was based on community feedback and it included the upgrade of the East Brisbane Bowls Club. However, that plan was kept secret and a different plan was released by your LNP administration, which illustrated the permanent demolition of that community facility. You've now had months to consider this and conduct your own inquiries to find out who gave the directive to alter the Mowbray Park vision against community wishes. Lord Mayor, can you please now inform residents who gave that initial directive to change the plans to exclude the upgrade of the East Brisbane Bowls Club and demolish it instead against community feedback. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Well, this is an interesting question because as usual, it is uh, loaded with inaccurate statements uh, that uh, Labor Party would like to uh, have people treat as facts, but uh, not indeed factual. Now, I'm not aware of any directives given, but I've made it really clear right from the beginning that I support the provision of better and enhanced and more green space. I support investment in upgrading and improving our parkland because green space is absolutely precious. Park park, not green absolutely. space, you're talking about. And we know that this uh, so-called bowls club hasn't operated for over a decade. So uh, anyone that wants to save the bolo, that horse has bolted. Uh, mm. But also know that Backbone, that fantastic organisation that supports so many up and coming artists, has been given a new home. And the feedback I hear is that they are delighted with the new facilities. So uh, what is happening here is that uh, when you uh, get together with your green colleagues and run a fake campaign, then what you see is the ground moving from beneath you. Uh, we see that community does want more and improved green space. We know that Backbone has been looked after with fantastic facilities which are near new 
and which they, uh, I'm told, are delighted with. And so what is it you are fighting for? Who is it you are fighting for? Uh, because I can tell you, if you're fighting for backbone, well, they've been looked after. Uh, well, if, if you're fighting, of East Brisbane fighting have a community facility. Councillors free, yeah. please. No interjecting. If you're fighting, if you're well, fighting for well, increasing... Well, that's increasing. the question. Councillor Sprunk, please. No interjecting. Thanks, Mr Chair. Uh, they asked the question, but they don't want to hear the answer. Time well, you time. asked us the question. Councillor Strunk, please. Order. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, contrary to what the Lord Mayor just said, we do want an answer to the question, and it was very simple. Who changed the plans behind closed doors? He's talking uh, a lot of, uh, about a lot of other stuff here except for answering that question. Well, Who the changed the point of order? Councillor Cassidy, uh, Lord Mayor, you have the floor. Your answer, the question is being answered. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, I answered that in my very first sentence. I answered that straight away. So, uh, look, you know, the, the point is, I am passionate about providing enhanced green space to our growing community. Uh, everyone knows it out in the community. They know that's what I stand for. They know what I stand for, which is record investment in parkland and green space. And they know that I'm all about building infrastructure. They know uh, that I am all about making sure we deal with the, the growth challenges that our city has faced and is facing uh, and will continue to face. And so there should be no surprises here that we want to improve what is an amazing parkland area. There should be no surprises to anyone. Uh, but th the reason why uh, we have called this a fake campaign is because the, the question I asked before, who are they actually fighting for? Backbone has been provided a new facility. East Brisbane. So, right. The East reality Brisbane is East Brisbane 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 are going to be provided East an Brisbane amazing Brisbane upgraded Mowbray Park. They will be provided an amazing upgraded Mowbray Park. And I know that they will value it. I know that they Bring will. Richmond and down. it's one of the key bits of feedback we continue to receive. Investment in parkland and improving green space is one of the top priorities for Brisbane residents mm -hmm. as our city grows. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Davis. Councillor Davis, last week in committee, we were briefed on Council's finalised off-road cycling strategy. Could you please update the Chamber on the importance of this strategy, including getting the balance right between there being more to see and do and keeping Brisbane clean, green and sustainable? Thank you, Councillor Davis. Well, thank you, Chair, and through you, uh, can I thank Councillor Mackay for the question. Mr Chair, the Sharina Council is committed to creating a clean and green Brisbane while encouraging active and healthy lifestyles. Our subtropical climate makes Brisbane the perfect place to enjoy the great outdoors. So it's not, no surprise that Brisbane residents and visitors are constantly looking for new ways to enjoy our outdoor areas, and off-road cycling is one of them. So to meet this growing demand, the Brisbane Off-Road Cycling Strategy aims to provide a safe, well-planned and connected network of facilities that also protects Brisbane's natural environment. Many people think of off-road cycling as mountain biking on single trails, but it is so much more than that. As outlined in the strategy, it includes gravel riding, skills tracks, dirt jumps, pump tracks, cyclocross circuits, and of course, the use of shared trails and fire tracks. Mr. Chair, in 2019, Council engaged with key stakeholder groups and the broader community about their ideas for future off-road cycling opportunities across the city. And this information was used to develop the draft strategy, which was released for further consultation in late 2020. And it was great to see the great enthusiasm of the various stakeholders as Council received a large amount of information and feedback on both occasions. And through the stakeholder feedback, key themes emerged, which helped inform the final strategy, which was released in December last year. And these themes included a need for a range of off-road cycling opportunities for people of different ages, of different skill levels, particularly spaces for young people and families and providing facilities that were accessible and linked in with existing bikeway networks while ensuring the safety of users, especially if off-road cycling was allowed on shared trails and fire tracks. 
but also identified was the need for education and promotion of trail etiquette and appropriate behaviour when using the trails. And finally, the need to address unauthorised trail construction and ensure facilities could be located, designed and constructed to protect the natural environment and native wildlife. Mr Chair, the protection of native flora and fauna is a priority and proposed off-road cycling infrastructure will be designed and located to have minimal impact on the natural habitat. The strategy identified some of our bushland reserves that were not considered suitable for off-road cycling, including areas such as Whites Hills Reserve. A detailed environmental assessment will be required to be undertaken to ensure any new facilities considered are sustainable. Mr Chair, the strategy also provides a high-level roadmap to guide future investment in design and delivery of off-road cycling facilities across the city. A range of opportunities and facilities have been identified for people of different ages, skill levels and abilities to enjoy the city's parks and natural areas while protecting our unique natural environment. As well, uh, listing short and long-term potential locations, various actions are also outlined in the strategy to ensure there is more to see and do across the city. And one of those actions is to develop and implement an updated trail care program to promote community stewardship of off-road cycling facilities. Um, a dedicated trail care program coordinator has now been appointed and they'll set about delivering the citywide program. Council will also look to improve mountain bike riding and off-road cycling at Mount Cootha Reserve and address unauthorised, tra unauthorised trails within the area. Since the creation of the first single-use track at Mount Cootha in 2003, we've seen a surge in the number of people who are now using the track. In fact, there are more than 700,000 people that visit the Mount Cootha tracks and trails each year, and these are operating at capacity. Uh, this will be addressed through the preparation of a mountain bike concept plan for Mount Cootha. Through the development of this concept plan, we'll seek to manage demand and protect the reserve's significant environmental and heritage values. Mr Chair, by striking a balance in providing the right facilities in the right locations, we will meet this growing demand while protecting our significant habitat and wildlife corridors. With new off-road cycling opportunities creating more to see and do, we're building an even better Brisbane for the future. Thank you, Councillor yeah. Davis. Further questions? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. It's been more than four months since residents, local businesses and myself contacted Council about the Rage Cage in Corinda, a business operating from a character house that smashes things apparently for fun, causing loud, violent smashing noises, obscene swearing and much distress and disruption for adjoining residents and businesses. Council has confirmed the business is unauthorised and unpermitted but it continues to operate despite, despite multiple requests. No noise testing has been undertaken. As it has been more than four months, why hasn't council conducted noise testing and why hasn't this unauthorised business been shut down? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, Councillor Johnson, uh, through you, Mr Chair, I'm not aware of uh, this specific issue. Uh, happy to ground truth um, the situation there for you. Uh, and Residents have written to you. Thanks, Councillor Johnston. Our question is being answered. And uh, certainly, um, as Councillor Johnston is well aware, um, she's been a councillor for a very long time. Uh, when uh, a business is identified as being not lawful, uh, then uh, council makes all steps to give that business the opportunity to uh, justify whether they can become lawful or not. Four and if months. they can't become lawful, lawful... That's the wrong approach here. Councillor Johnston, yeah. please. And if that business can't justify that it can become lawful uh, and can't uh, make changes to become lawful, then at that time, appropriate action is is uh, taken. That That is always the way that we deal with any situation. Uh, we don't come in with jackboots uh, overnight and close businesses down. Uh, we give them an opportunity, as is the law, uh, to either become lawful or to move out and find a suitable premises. But that's a general statement in terms of how we deal with uh, reports of businesses that may not be lawful across the city. 
But in this particular case, uh, happy to uh, investigate and uh, find more information for Councillor Johnston. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further questions? Councillor Landers. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, Councillor Howard. Councillor Howard, with Brisbane summer well and truly upon us, could you please update the Chamber on all of the ways Brisbane residents can stay cool in our pools this summer, including any upgrades that are scheduled for this year? Thank you, Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and through you I thank Councillor Landers for the question. And while it's certainly been an interesting summer with uh, more unexpected rain than usual, it hasn't stopped the residents of Brisbane from enjoying a swim. One of the things we look forward to when the weather warms up is getting a good old swim in the pool. And during 2021, the residents of Brisbane did exactly that. I'm very happy to report that record-breaking crowds of more than 3.9 million people visited one of our Brisbane City Council's 22 aquatic facilities last year, with thousands more expected to make a splash throughout the summer period of 2022. Our pools network really do have something for everyone, allowing the residents of Brisbane, regardless of age or ability, to cool off and spend time in Council's 22 aquatic facilities. People can visit Brisbane's pools for any number of reasons, with many of the pools within our network offering features such as aquatic play, gym and fitness facilities, and the space to sit back and have some fun in the sun. For those seeking a structured way to stay active while cooling off in the pool, Council runs active and healthy events across our network of pools, including aqua yoga, a low impact form of exercise that supports the body while still providing function and movement adapted for the pool, aqua aerobics, allowing persons to stretch and tone while enjoying the benefits of the water, great music and positive vibes, and aqua zumba, a blend of the zumba philosophy with water resistance. Council offers a range of different swim programs for all skill levels, allowing visitors to increase their confidence in the pool and to break personal bests in their swimming endeavours. These include our Learn to Swim sessions, squad swimming programs, stroke development activities, and our Empowered to Swim group swimming lessons, which allow patrons to embrace the water and learn how to swim and engage in the aquatic environment safely. Our pools also offer a great way for families and individuals alike to cool off and have a fun day out during the warmer months of the year, with a number of council pools having aqua play facilities that can keep our little ones entertained for hours on end. These include spray-based water play features in the Beach Entry Lagoon Pool at Acacia Ridge Leisure Centre, the water park with six water slides and lagoon play area at Chermside Aquatic Centre, the 20 metre long twisting water slide at Hibiscus Sports Complex and Pool at Mount Gravatt, and the children's splash pad and wading pools with slides at various facilities across our pool network. Our modern state-of-the-art pool network also cater for those seeking active and recreation activities outside of the pool, with gym and barbecue facilities located at a number of locations across the pool network. With almost 4 million people visiting council pools last year, it shows that Brisbane residents are making the most of council's ongoing investment and improvement of these much-loved venues. In the year ahead, Council has planned and scheduled exciting new upgrade works for our pools network, giving Brisbane residents an even better reason to visit our public pools and ensure that the Brisbane of tomorrow is even better than the Brisbane of today. As a highlight, Council is kicking things off this year with a 3.4 million upgrade of Newmarket Olympic Swimming Pool. This will replace the 50 metre pool with new shade, tiles, starting blocks and wet decking as well as a new all abilities pool ramp. The filtration systems will also be upgraded, including in the existing 25 metre pool and two children's wading pools. Site works will commence in early February until the end of March 2022 and the 50 metre pool will be closed for replacement from April through to the end of 2022, while the 25 metre pool and wading pools will remain open. The new market swimming pool upgrade not only represents a great outcome for the City of Brisbane, but also a great example of the partnership between Council and the lessees of our pools network. We're excited to see that the new market pool has in store as works are completed, and we are sure that it will continue to remain a well-attended and enjoyed facility into the future. 
Other upgrades to Brisbane's public pools in recent years include the upgrades to Langlands Park Memorial Pool, Musgrave Park Swimming Centre and the Sandgate Aquatic Centre. Each one of these upgrades has resulted in even better aquatic facilities within our pools network, and the strong demand and use of these facilities has shown just how valued they are to the residents of Brisbane. These investments also put Brisbane in a prime position to give our budding athletes with their eyes set on 2032 the perfect locations to train, with the goal of bringing home gold for Brisbane at the upcoming Olympics. We know that even now a number of representatives of Australia's Olympic swimming team train Councillor at... Councillor Howard, your time has expired. Further questions? Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, Labor continues to fight for the people of East Brisbane and to save community facilities. You've just been asked to tell the Chamber and the people of this city who gave the directive to include demolition of the East Brisbane Bowls Club as part of the Mowbray Park vision. You just said that despite having had months to conduct your own investigation, you are, and I quote, not aware of any directives given. It is now clear that you, as the current leader of this city, don't care, don't want to know, or don't want the public to know, who in your Schrinner administration blatantly ignored community feedback and decided to bulldoze this community facility. Lord Mayor Labor has been made aware of an email that's been sent between council officers about the decision to demolish the East Brisbane Bowls Club site. In this email, one council officer writes to another, and I quote, I've had some further advice regarding the scope of what we can show in the plan. It goes on to say, remove reference to new community facility from plan and include demolition of Bowls Club building supported. There is no explanation as to where this advice came from. You've admitted today you don't know about any directives, so will you now conduct an independent investigation into the creation of the Mobe Park vision, including who blatantly ignored community feedback and in the meantime halt any plans to demolish this facility until the truth is revealed. Lord Mayor. Well, another so-called question, which was more like a statement, uh, once again, full of mistruths and misleading information. Uh, so uh, I, I again say, I'm not aware of any directive. And, and what's more, um, I am not aware of any uh, decision by this administration uh, to uh, build a new community facility in that park. Uh, what we wanted to do is to provide better and more parkland. No one in this administration uh, has ever uh, suggested that part of our plan would be to build a new building in that park. That's never been part of our plan. We've never promised that to anyone. So uh, I'm not sure where that idea came from, but it certainly wasn't from this administration. Uh, so this is a parks project and our intent is to upgrade and improve the park and green space. Why? For the residents of Brisbane and particularly the residents of that precinct, East Brisbane, Kangaroo Point and the surrounding suburbs. Uh, so, the, you know, Labor and the way that they've approached this is just extraordinary. Um, as I said before, um, so they've run a campaign to save the bolo. The bolo hasn't been a bolo for over a decade. There is no bolo. Uh, then they ran a campaign to say backbone. We provided a new facility for backbone. And so, as I said, who are they fighting for? The reality is this is just another purely political ploy by the opposition and they are barking up the wrong tree. If they were genuine, they would be running a campaign, for example, on the Tawong Bolo. Where's their campaign on the Tawong Bolo? We know that the Labor state government, with the support of the Greens MP for the area, wants to bulldoze the Tawong Bolo. Operating Bowls Club. Yes, and that's actually a real bolo, unlike a bolo at East Brisbane that hasn't been a bolo for a decade. And so this is completely disingenuous from Labor. It is purely political. Uh, when, when they have the opportunity to save an actual bolo, they don't. They go quiet. And Labor and the Greens are in lockstep. We've been warning about this. 
the Labor Greens Alliance are in lockstep. They're in lockstep with their fake campaign on the so-called East Brisbane Bolo that doesn't exist. And they're also in lockstep. You're opposed? They're not doing anything to, to the support site for the, the Gawong Bolo demolition, which is actually a bolo. Now, Are you opposed? my position has been absolutely consistent. Sam is anti-school. Is... <laughs> no interjections, please, during the question time. Well, Councillor Cassidy, I'll take that one. Um, I've never known a time when Brisbane City Council is responsible for schools. Um, but... We are responsible but now, for now. And are you? We no, are responsible like Cassidy, for the East Brisbane, and we're responsible for improving that. And so, my position on East Brisbane is exactly consistent with Tuong. And East I Brisbane, want better green space. I want more green space. Removing community facilities for Mitchell Cassidy, please. please. I want better green space for our community, whether it's at Tuong or whether it's, it's not East green Brisbane. space. You're putting bitumen down. So, what we want to do here is be consistent, unlike the Labor Party. And so our position on Tuong is the state government, together with the Greens, want to demolish a bolo and build a school. What we want is appropriate offsetting so that we can provide more green Point space order, to replace order, the order, people Cassidy. of that area. This question was about halting the demolition of the East Brisbane Bowls Club and an independent investigation into political meddling in that process. And the Lord Mayor's just spent the last minute and a half talking about the Tawong Bowls Club and being opposed to new state schools. Could you bring him back to the question, please, Chair? Lord Mayor, to the question, please. The only political meddling is the Labor and Greens meddling in this fake campaign. Uh, there is no East Brisbane Bowls Club to save. And Backbone has been provided with a new facility. And so what is it that Labor is doing here? What is it the Greens are doing here? It is an entirely fake manufactured campaign to save a bolo that doesn't exist and to save a community group, Backbone, that has been provided another facility. No, we're so trying to save a space for musicians It is a completely and manufactured issue here and it is completely inconsistent with their position on another bolo in another part of the city which Labor and the Greens are meddling in as well. We uh, need a so space for my position and will remain consistent, Brisbane. which is I support green space. I support investment in green space. I support and where the green space removed uh, for investment in new green space to replace that green space that is removed by Labor and Greens meddling. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Your time Labor has, is not Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Thank you. Point for of order. Questions. Councillor Hutton. Point of order. Point of order to you, Councillor Cook. Chair, under section 12, subsection 3, I move the suspension of the standing rules to allow me to move a motion. <laughs> so, uh, Councillor Cook has moved a motion for the suspension of standing rules, uh, and you need to establish why uh, 9 3 could not be met. That would be to include the motion for debate on the agenda. Uh, Councillor Cook, you have Thank three you. minutes. Thank you. I have just emailed the motion through, Chair, uh, and it is this, that Brisbane City Council immediately cease any plans to demolish the East Brisbane Bowls Club. Uh, two, undertakes an urgent independent investigation to review the creation of the Mobe Park vision and uncover the source of the directive to remove all references to the upgrade of the East Brisbane Bowls Club. And three, drafts a new Mowbray Park vision, which includes undertaking genuine and Councillor Cook, uh, you, Councillor Cook, you are now going to what would be the motion if it were agreed. Uh, Chair, that is the motion. Yes, but you need to uh, sustain the argument as to why you were not able to put this on the agenda by one o'clock yesterday afternoon. Thank, thank you, Chair. This motion. That, that is that is what you are able to debate here. Thank you. This motion was not able to be placed on the agenda as a notified motion because we've only just heard right now from the Lord Mayor seconds ago that he either has no idea where this directive came from or he's being secretive and withholding information from the people of this city. Mm -hmm. Chair, I gave the Mayor the opportunity to answer this question in a bid to get to the bottom of this so we oh, wouldn't no. need to bring the motion. But it's now clear. Oh, yeah, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Lord Mayor. Claim to be misrepresented. Thank you. Noted. It, it's now clear that an independent investigation is needed, and this is the point of the standing rules to allow these motions to take place in this place when these issues are raised. No, the standing rules are to establish why you couldn't put it on 
the notice paper. Because yesterday. we were waiting to hear what the mayor had to say today. It was entirely dependent on his answer today. He could have disclosed the source, uh, Mr Chair, if he had answered truthfully and told the people where this directive came from, uh, this motion I'm would have been needed. Outrageous. Given this LNP Lord Mayor is the one in charge of the Shredder Council, he should and probably does know, but clearly he's not willing to explain himself to the people of East Brisbane and therefore a thorough Point investigation order, is needed. Point of order to you, Councillor Adams. I believe Councillor Cook is imputing motive and debating the motion, not why it couldn't be on by one o'clock yesterday. Thank you. Chair, Please, the reason Councilor this Cook. could not be on the agenda by 1pm yesterday is because the people of East Brisbane deserve an answer to the questions that have been asked today. Not yesterday, today. They deserve to know who made the decision to ignore their feedback and bulldoze this facility. Uh, it's not right that these decisions are being made behind, behind closed doors and against the wishes of ratepayers. Um, residents expect transparency. They don't get it in question time in this council. And now Cook, we are bringing the motion to try and get that transparency and Councilor accountability. Cook, your time has expired. This motion before us is uh, for the suspension of standing claim, rules. Claim to be misrepresented. Um, sorry, I'll go to that first, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, your claim of misrepresentation. Uh, yes, Councillor Cook was suggesting I hadn't answered the questions before. I answered all of the questions that were asked very clearly, Mr Chair. Thank you, Lord Mayor. The motion before us is for the suspension of standing rules. All in favour of the motion for the suspension of standing rules, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. aye. All opposed, please say no. Raise your hands. No. No. Jane. Are there any abstentions? I declare that motion lost. Division. 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 Division has been called by Councillors Cassidy and seconded by Councillor Strunk. Please ring the bells. As all councillors are here, we'll now move to the vote on the division. The division is over whether or not to suspend standing rules. All in favour of the suspension of standing rules, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. aye. Thank you. All opposed, please say no and raise your hands. No. no. Are there any abstentions? Clarks? Mr Chair, the noes have it. The uh, voting being seven in favour and 19 against. Thank you. The motion no, for the Mr. suspension Chair. of standing rules has been lost. Point of order. Councillor Cook, point of order. Thank you, um, Mr Chair. Just a procedural question. Uh, you've very intentionally today not read the motion. Uh, can you be clear as to, obviously, the subject of the motion is relevant. Uh, what is your direction to councillors in this place around bringing motions under Section 12, Subsection 3? Yes. Uh, is the motion to be read? Because how are we to know if we are to suspend standing orders if it's not on the Thank you, Councillor Cook. I, I, I hear your question. The, put the motion before us was for the suspension of standing rules. That was the motion on which we were voting. Thank you. Move on to further questions. Councillor Hutton. Point of order. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Yeah, just, just to follow up on that, um, uh, I... Your answer there is, is concerning me. Um, if we are to move the suspension of standing orders, we must know the purpose for which we suspend standing orders. Uh, so uh, uh, could you just confirm that um, you are saying now that what we're allowed to move is I move suspension of standing orders and that's it? Um, and then are we just supposed to say urgent, urgent, urgent for three minutes? Thank you, Councillor Johnson. I gave my ruling... I believe the motion had been circulated to all councillors. The motion before us was 
for the suspension of standing rules. I continue with question time. Councillor Hutton. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Cook. This better not be a repetitive point of order. Uh, it's not, Mr Chair. I just want to clarify. Uh, I moved the suspension of standing orders to allow me to move a motion. I paused, sent the motion, and then proceeded to read it. And as I was reading the motion, you said you've moved into the substantive debate, which I hadn't. I then said, I'm reading the motion. So I'm just a bit the, unclear. The, the I didn't motion, just Councillor move the Cook suspension of standing us. orders. I Thank moved you. the motion. Thank you, Councillor yeah. Cook. Uh, you which can, I then you... read. Pausing doesn't actually mean that I haven't finished what I was saying to send the email that is required under the rules. Councillor Cook, the motion before us was for the suspension of standing rules and that was the motion on which we took a vote. Thank you. I'm going to, to continue. To allow me time. to move Point the order. motion. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Um, Mr Chair, I do just refer you to Section 12.3 um, of the meeting's local law. Um, if we are to suspend standing rules, it says it must establish to the satisfaction of council the appropriate reasons for not meeting the requirement, i.e. the 24-hour rule. So just to be clear, um, in establishing appropriate reasons for, this, uh, for the suspension of standing orders, we have to say what and why uh, to meet the requirements of subsection 12.3. So I, I just bring to your attention that your decision there seems to be at odds with section uh, 12.3 of the meeting's local law. 12.3 says a councillor must, moving to suspend standing rules, has up to three minutes to justify why the 9.3 requirement could not be met, uh, and that was the vote on which council was voting. That was well, the motion Kennedy, before us. Councillor Johnston, Subsection 12.3a says exactly what I just said, which is you must establish to the satisfaction of council the appropriate reasons. So if we have to establish the reasons, there must be some substantive discussion about why uh, it is required. So, I'm so, just... the, so the question was whether the requirements under 9.3 had been met by the motion to suspend standing rules. Uh, that was the vote that was put to council and it was voted down in division. I'm going to move on with question time. Thank you. Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Councillor Wines. Councillor Wines, a mammoth $1.2 billion was allocated by the Lord Mayor in this year's budget for building our city's infrastructure. Could you uh, please point of order, I'm, I'm very sorry. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Yes, Mr Chairman, again, Section 9.3 of the meeting's local law simply requires a councillor who want a motion included on the agenda to provide that notion, motion to the CEO uh, by 1pm the prior business day. It makes no statements or uh, guidance about... Um, suspending local laws to move more urgent matters. That is under section subsection 12. Um, so uh, I think there is a bit of a problem here and I appreciate you want to move on, but I, I, I don't think this problem is going to go away until we get some further clarity. Um, it's been normal practice in the 14 years I've been here to move the motion, in fact, it's been required by previous chairs to be put in writing, to be outlined. So Thank I just... You. We're having Councillor a disconnect here. Johnston, um, I, I'm firm in my opinion as to what the standing Correct. rules Correct. say, Correct. Um, and that is that the requirement was for the uh, the councillor to establish why the motion couldn't be put on the notice paper uh, by 1 p.m. yesterday, uh, and that was the vote that was put to the council, and the vote was taken. Uh, I'm going to move on. Mm. Councillor three. Not right. Please, okay. <laughs> Point of order, Chair. Sorry, um, I was just going to move uh, uh, that we have a five-minute adjournment while you seek legal advice on the interpretation of that part of the meeting's local law. No, I don't think that's necessary. Thank you, Councillor Street. We're moving on to question time. Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, my Please question repeat the is, question. Thank you. My oh. question is to the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, <laughs> Councillor Wines. Councillor Wines, a mammoth $1.2 billion was allocated by the Lord Mayor in this year's budget for building our city's infrastructure. Could you please update the Chamber on what works are in store for the first half of this year? Thank you, Councillor Wines. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hutton, and 
And thank you for completing the question. There was quite an opportunity to build up anticipation to what this answer may well be. Um, when we last spoke, it was Christmas time, and I said to the council, um, I want you to imagine the city as a tree and that the works we do amongst it are but the tinsel and lights of that tree. But this year we start again and we start in Chinese New Year. So I want to wish all councillors a Xinyan Kuai Lei. And I want you to imagine the city as a mandarin, a gift, uh, a gift given for prosperity uh, at this time of year. And I want you to imagine that the city is a mandarin uh, that's easily accessible to all and the pieces are distributed evenly across the city, uh, an opportunity for a sweet uh, ride in your motor vehicle, regardless of where you are in the city of Brisbane. Can I recognise Councillor Hutton uh, for your area, the Monia Bellwood Works, as they are approaching uh, the southwest of the city does see works that's going to be a very important intersection upgrade that will make that part of the city operate even better. Can I also... Uh, we might, so from the southwest to the southeast, uh, within weeks we'll be turning on the new lights as part of the, part of the Chelsea Rickett Road upgrades. They will be, in, as, as I said again, in the spirit of Chinese New Year, red and yellow uh, with a, a green as well on top of that. But these, uh, the Lord Mayor uh, has, is coming out to the uh, eastern suburbs to switch on those lights imminently. And uh, the only reason that those uh, lights and that road work is yet to be complete. It has been the summer rain. Uh, because that is a relatively low-lying area, uh, we haven't been able to get at it over the December period. And of course, obviously COVID has meant that not all crews have been able to work as we would normally program them to do. So those works begin, uh, those works are completed within weeks with a turning on of the lights, uh, I hope within the next fortnight. Uh, the, the creek line near Chelsea Ricket is called Tim Galper Creek for those who are not familiar uh, with that part of the world. And it does act as a, um, as a road that leads people between Brisbane City and the Redland Shire. Uh, also, staying not far from that part of the world, uh, the Rochdale Priestdale intersection uh, has commenced. Now, I read with interest uh, some weeks ago a Brisbane Times article that referred to 13 projects that were federally funded that were yet to begin. I want council to know that of those, only three were within council's jurisdiction and of those, they have all begun. I think that's important to reflect upon. So they, that particular news article said they were in planning uh, and this was one of them. Chelsea Rickett was uh, one of those that they identified in that article as in planning, when in reality, uh, it, it has commenced. So you will see signage, you will see crews preparing the site, you will see uh, diggers preparing for that expansion. Interestingly, again, that, that uh, particular piece of work is so far to the boundary of the city that if you would imagine uh, the, the intersection, the four-way intersection, the southeast corner of that intersection actually belongs to Logan City Council, while the other three uh, quarters of the, the roadway belong to, um, belong to uh, Brisbane City Council. So service relocation has begun. Uh, the site preparation has begun. Drainage works have begun. So I just wanted to respond to that. Uh, that uh, that article and just make sure that the council was confident that the works that were required of us have have begun and, uh, and that they are, they are not merely in planning, but they have in fact commenced. Uh, to the other side of the city, uh, within the next quarter, we will see the Gresham Street Bridge lowered into place. And I know that Councillor Toomey has had a keen interest in that particular project. Uh, the bridge itself, we have built a, a sort of an engineered uh, temporary bridge, a structure that uh, can be used um, for quite some time. So for more than a year, there's been a temporary bridge in place as we prepare site, we put in pilings, we prepare footings and we construct a bridge. And within the next quarter, you will see that bridge lowered into position. And uh, it's a bridge for those people who don't know that area, that particular community can only be accessed either by this bridge or in extreme disasters through the local golf club. So they, uh, there are very few options for people who actually live in this community to, um, to exit it. And as you could well imagine, the local golf club does resist vehicles going through there ordinarily, only they only allow it during extreme events. So this bridge is a necessary and important part of accessing that community for some hundreds of residents, if not 
hundreds of households. And Councillor so that will be Wines, fair. your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. That ends all the best for the year to time. Uh, we now move on with the remainder of the agenda uh, at uh, item four, consideration of committee reports. Lord Mayor, Lord Establishment Lord and Coordination Committee of Councillor Johnston. You have a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move suspension of standing orders. Seconded. So, Councillor Johnson has moved a motion for the suspension of standing orders. And Seconded. Been seconded by Councillor Cook. Um, Councillor Johnson, do you have a reason for wanting to um, suspend standing rules? Did you want me to outline one, Mr. Chairman? Councillor Johnson, if you're not uh, providing a response, then we're going to well, move no, on. I definitely, the... I definitely want to speak for three minutes, but I, I, the reason I'm moving uh, this motion to suspend standing orders um, is because uh, it is now 1.50 p.m. on Tuesday, and uh, I could not move the motion to suspend standing orders uh, by 1 p.m. on Monday under Section 9 three, uh, but now it turns out that I can only move the suspension of standing orders uh, referring to section 93 uh, because it is 1.50 p.m. on Tuesday. So uh, it is uh, of great concern to me um, that in suspending standing orders, I can apparently do so without providing any reason or information or justification about why I want to suspend standing orders, which is clearly uh, contrary to section uh, 12.3a, um, which is supposed to uh, ensure that appropriate reasons are given for the suspension of standing orders. Um, but based on the ruling that's been put before us today, um, the only justification we're required to give for the suspension of standing orders is to say why we could not do it by 1 p.m. And the reason I could not move the suspension of standing orders today by 1 p.m. is because uh, it's 1.50 p.m. Uh, and I would just bring to everybody who's listening uh, attention um, the perverseness of the decision that's been made here today, um, the fact that it does not reflect either the meeting's local law nor the 14 years of practice that I've observed uh, at council. And clearly the intention of the meeting's local law is to provide appropriate reasons uh, why the uh, meetings local laws uh, should be overturned under the relevant standing order. Um, but clearly that's not actually required any longer because the Chairman of Council doesn't uh, feel that we have to Point of order, Mr Chair. Reasons. Point of order to you, Councillor Adams. Um, relevance, why are we suspending standing orders? Yes. <laughs> you can read your motion, Councillor Johnson, Johnson, but you can't debate it. You <laughs> haven't read the rules. Well, there you Please, go. You Councillor, the Councillor Johnston, as, <laughs> as you're well aware, there have been amended meetings local law. Yeah. Uh, I, I do suggest you you read up on them. Uh, oh, well, I've read this, Mr Chairman, and I am ruling, taking you at your word. The ruling you has the been The only requirement consistent. we need to meet uh, is 9-3 under the meetings local law. You said it multiple times. So the only reason uh, for us now to remove... Uh, to move a suspension of standing orders um, is that it's 3.50 p.m. As, uh, sorry, it's 1.50 p.m. It's not 1 p.m. the previous day. Um, and, you know, in my view that there is a problem with that because Section 12.3 requires appropriate reasons to be given, but you've repeatedly said both to Councillor Cook and myself um, that you don't want reasons. So now we've got the Deputy Mayor saying that there should be reasons as well, uh, ah, but you're leaving us in a very difficult position, Mr Chairman, um, because this is a two-step Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Adams. Claim to be misrepresented. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Well, okay. um, the perverseness of this, as I was outlining, is um, that it is always uh, and is still a two-step process. Um, you have to establish uh, why uh, the matter could not have been dealt with the previous day by one o'clock, but to do so, you must establish appropriate reasons. Those reasons obviously need to provide information, context and uh, advice about why there's a standing orders should be um, should be overturned. It's very clear that the advice given to Councillor Cook and myself today um, is 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 faulty um, and does not meet the requirements of the meetings local law. So I think I, we should. Councillor Johnson, the your local time law. has 
expired. The motion before us is uh, for point of order, suspension. Mr. Chair, I had oh, sorry, Councillor Adams, your point of misrepresentation, please. Yes, Thank you. Standard. I did not say you could not read out the motion. I was just backing what you said, Mr. Chair. Read the motion. Tell us why it couldn't be there. But it doesn't get read out again when you're suspending. Thank you. Um, Councillors, the motion. Need to provide the motion, any detail. Councillors, the motion before us is for the suspension of standing rules. All in favour of that motion, please say aye. Raise your hands. Aye. Any opposed, please say no and raise your hands. No. No. <laughs> Are there any abstentions? Oh, okay. The motion is lost. Councillors, we're moving division. on. A division has been moved by Councillor Johnston. There appears to be no seconder. Uh, Lord Mayor, Establishment and Coordination uh, coordination Committee Report of the 31st of January, 2022. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 31st of January, 2022, be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by the Lord Mayor and seconded by the Deputy Mayor that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, 31 January 2022 be adopted. Lord Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. And um, I, look, I just wanted to um, commend you on your patience there. Um, I, look, I've seen more coherent debating uh, in kindergarten with my uh, two kids at kindergarten than I've just seen in the chamber now. That was pathetic and childish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I have to say, it's very clear. Um, the, the rules are very clear. You have to explain why you want to move a particular motion uh, and why it couldn't not have been. According to the chairperson, you're not on allowed to do that. He's just been very clear. You can't do that. Apparently, you can interrupt anytime you want as well. Uh, but you have to explain why you couldn't lodge a notice of motion by 1 p.m. 24 hours ago. And so it's, it's simply, why is this matter of a high enough priority that you couldn't lodge it 24 hours ago? That's very clear. Everyone knows it. Um, but we've seen this childish contribution. Not the chairperson, it's just clearly. just really a shame. Because and we're concerned about your corruption. Oh, Mr Chair. Shame. Point of order, Mr so Chair, you, you that needs to be to, removed. You're allowed to say those things in this place now, are you? That is outrageous. Sorry, Councillor Griffiths, can you please withdraw right. those comments? If you won't, you won't answer any questions. You won't do anything. You won't participate in Councillor emotions. Griffiths, please, will you withdraw? That's that unacceptable that behaviour. Uh, it was quite clear they were worried about what is going Councillor on with Griffiths, the Rules Club, and you're Councillor, just shamming it. Councillor Griffiths, you do not have the floor, and your your behaviour in this place is unacceptable. Lord Mayor. Wow. <laughs> see uh, up in yeah, George wow. Street, Let's a see. genuine integrity <laughs> crisis going on. <laughs> and, you know, try and contrast it with what happens in this council. I answer every question. I'm very clear about what the priorities of this administration are. And guess what they are? They're about providing better and more green space for people. This is what question time was all about. Yet... You see Labor councils completely ignoring that fact and that statement and those answers because they want to manufacture issues and run fake campaigns. Uh, the only integrity crisis that we see in this place is a lack of integrity on the opposition benches, a serious lack of integrity. Councillors that will do and say anything to Point try and make a political yeah. point. Yeah. And it is order, really order, order, Lord Mayor, not reading out motions, Johnson. Hey? Point of order. Um, uh, Mr Chairman, I seek your direction. Uh, the Lord Mayor uh, and Deputy Mayor objected to being called corrupt um, and they're now saying that opposition councillors lack integrity. Uh, that is uh, also um, offensive and should be withdrawn. Oh, that would be nice, withdrawal. Councillor, Lord Mayor, do you wish to... Uh, attend well, to that issue? Look, I, I know that Councillor Johnston believes that she's the leader of the opposition, but uh, the formal opposition... Point of order, Mr Labor Chairman. Party is the Point Labor of order, party. Mr Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Um, I'm not the leader of the opposition, but I am a councillor in this place that's raised a valid point of order under the meeting's local law and yeah, based yeah. on your yeah. previous direction, uh, are you going to address the issue 
um, of whether it's appropriate to say councillors lack integrity. Previous direction has never been followed. Councillor Lord well, Mayor. Again, that wasn't put to the Lord Mayor, which is the chairperson's job. Lord Mayor, will you will you respond to that uh, request, please? Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, look, I believe Labor councillors do lack integrity uh, because all of their actions in recent times have indicated that, and it's really disappointing. I would Lord expect Chair. more. So, point of order, Mr. Chair. Councillors. Jonathan, you want to do it? It hurts. I mean, I don't point know if I'm doing the same thing as you are, Nicole, but I did have a point of order. Um, Councillor three. Yeah, look, look Chair, I, I, I personally think it should be fine for people to say that other councillors lack integrity or that other councillors are corrupt, but I'd just like a clear ruling from you because I'm confused now as to whether I am allowed to call another councillor corrupt or whether I am allowed to say that they lack integrity. Could you please give us a clear ruling on that? Um, councillors um, and Councillor Three, uh, a claim of corruption is potentially def defamatory. I uh, draw to your attention the laws of defamation, which don't apply in this place. Um, these comments are also contrary to the uh, standard of behaviour set by the, the state government for the conduct of, of meetings, the councillor code of conduct for councillors. I draw to all councillors the code of conduct and ask them to abide by the uh, code of conduct as laid down by the, uh, the Department of Local Government, uh, which has been circulated and all councillors are aware of. Thank you. So, sorry, sorry, just to clarify, you, yeah. so you're, you're saying we shouldn't call people corrupt because that's potentially defamatory, but if we say that someone lacks, lacks integrity, which is also potentially defamatory, that's mm -hmm. okay? I, I'm just, seriously, I'd just love to get it. The, these words are offensive in this place and I ask councillors not to use them, all councillors, please. Wait, is that the word yeah. lacks integrity or is that the word corrupt? To corruption and the question of integrity. Please. Okay, cool. So both, both of those these, things we shouldn't be words. saying. Councillor Cook, you have a point of order? Thank you. Point of order. Um, based on what you've just said, Mr Chair, uh, the statement just made by the Lord Mayor that Labor councillors lack integrity, I find offensive and I'd ask that he withdraw those comments. What about, what about Brooks's corruption? Lord, Lord, Lord Mayor, will you withdraw those comments? Now, thank you for clarifying, Mr Chair. One of uh, the roles that you have in this place is to uh, enforce the standards of behaviour. If you believe that um, that statement is offensive and not appropriate, I will withdraw, absolutely. Thank you, Lord uh, Mayor. Can we continue with the report? Uh, I would also expect that Councillor Griffiths would do the same thing. Councillor Griffiths, yeah, well, David. You, Councillor Griffiths, please. Uh, yes, will you withdraw, withdraw the comments that you made? On that advice, I would draw my accusation. Thank you, Councillor Griffiths. Lord Mayor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so back to uh, the point I was making, uh, we have up at George Street um, and all over the media, uh, an integrity crisis happening at the moment. Now, uh, this is a, a really serious issue, yet you see Labor and the way that they are trying to lower the debate in this place by making uh, statements that just don't add up um, about things that our position has been very clear on. Uh, we have been clear and consistent on Mowbray Park from the beginning. Now, Labor and the Greens may not like our position. That's fine. That's, you're entitled to that position. But we have made it clear. So to, to suggest in any way, shape or form that we haven't answered questions or we haven't been clear is a cl complete misrepresentation. Uh, we do want to provide enhanced green space for the people of Brisbane. We do want to invest in our parks, beautiful parks like Mowbray Park, so that more people can use them. Uh, we do want to make sure that where uh, a green space area is lost due to state government intervention, like over at Tuong Bowls Club, that that is provided um, back to the people with an appropriate offset. And that offset needs to provide an equivalent value of land somewhere else in the area so that people can uh, have some green space that is very important in growing parts of the city. And so our position is completely clear and it is completely consistent. And it is just extraordinary to see uh, Labor and the Greens having inconsistent positions on things. It's okay to remove the Tuong Bowls Club and Labor and the Greens agree on that, but it's not okay uh, for a Bowls Club that hasn't operated for over a decade uh, to remove that and provide enhanced green space. It is just extraordinary. Uh, but I, 
I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but I am disappointed uh, by the approach that Labor continues to take in this place. Moving on to other things, I did want to commend the state government on their recent decision regarding the check-in app. I think it is a good common sense decision uh, and I congratulate the government for that decision. Uh, obviously, uh, my view is that it's probably uh, a little bit late in coming, but it's better late than never. And so that was a good decision that will help relieve some of the burden for uh, not only uh, customers and residents wanting to check in or having to check in, uh, but also um, those uh, retail staff that um, have had to face the brunt of people's frustration um, about some of these rules that, um, you know, they write the question. Uh, this one in particular, checking in made a lot of sense when there was contact tracing occurring uh, and where the state government was actively following up saying, you know, you may have been a close contact. Um, someone with COVID was at that shop at that particular time. That made sense and people were happy to do that. Uh, but the moment uh, the government stopped doing contact tracing uh, was the moment that people saw no value in checking in. And so uh, we've got a good uh, step towards common sense happening now. Um, and I'm proud that we were able to lead the charge in that respect. Uh, and it is one that, you know, is not about politics. It's just about common sense. Uh, so once again, congratulations to the government for making the right decision there. And uh, we look forward to things getting more and more back to normal uh, as, as we move forward over the coming months. I did want to uh, also mention um, the fantastic uh, Briz Asia Festival that has kicked off uh, here in Brisbane in, in recent days. Uh, it is, I know, um, Councillor Wines was talking about Lunar New Year uh, and wishing everyone a happy new year. And I know it is a disappointment to everyone that many of the Lunar New Year events that we were hoping to have uh, were uh, cancelled or postponed. Uh, and, you know, it is very traditional in this city uh, and a growing tradition um, to get really into the spirit of the Lunar New Year. Uh, and so while many of those other events could not happen, unfortunately, we were determined to make sure that the Briz Asia Festival uh, went ahead because it is important to celebrate our links uh, to the Asian region uh, also to celebrate the great contribution so many residents uh, from the Asian region are making here in Brisbane to our local community and the amazing creative talent of that community. And that's exactly what Briz Asia Festival does. Uh, more than 50 different events uh, over the month of February. Uh, and they're not only just in the inner city, but all over Brisbane, multiple locations. Uh, there are some up in Fitzgibbon, I'm aware, happening. Um, and there are some down in Willowong, and everywhere in between, um, there's lots of great events happening. I wanted to uh, thank Councillor Allen, uh, Councillor Howard, uh, Councillor Landers, Councillor Hutton, Councillor Toomey and Councillor Cumming uh, for being part of the Briz Asia Festival launch. Uh, it was good to see you, Councillor Cumming. Uh, we expect to have you as a member of Team Shrina before too long. You're turning up to events with us. Um, it's good to see. Uh, keep up the good work and thank you for supporting Briz Asia Festival. Item A is yeah. uh, the, <laughs> what was that mumble? Yuck. Yuck. <laughs> it's got his Move on, Lord Mayor, please. We love you, Peter. We love you. Um, item A, significant contracting plan for the supply of electricity. Lord Mayor, uh, do you love me? <laughs> <laughs> I respect you. I wouldn't say love is the right word, but I respect you. Yeah. How do you feel about me? <laughs> yeah, me. I think I know pretty clearly. Enough, please. <laughs> this is not a sea of love. <laughs> uh, so uh, item A is the significant contracting plan for the supply of electricity uh, for a maximum term of up to 10 years. The uh, um, council procurement arrangement for electricity uh, will expire in June this year, last financial year. The combined spend across two categories covered in this SCP was approximately $32.5 million. Uh, and while our current electricity load is predicted to remain stable, uh, obviously we're taking measures wherever possible to reduce electricity use and increase sustainability. Uh, obviously we do need a ongoing supply arrangement in place uh, as we deal with um, particularly some of the big projects like Brisbane Metro. Uh, Brisbane Metro with 
uh, you know, 60 fully electric vehicles, the only ones of their kind in Australia. Mayor, your time has expired. For an, move for an extension. Seconded. Uh, an extension of time has been moved by Councillor Adams and, and seconded by Councillor Landers. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I was mentioning Brisbane Metro with the uh, the fast charging facilities for those 60 fully electric vehicles. Uh, that will require significant electricity demand, there's no doubt about it, uh, require uh, significant improvements in electricity infrastructure and obviously guaranteed ongoing supply. Uh, we, will, uh, we are designing the depot out at Rochdale with um, solar panels uh, right across the roof so that we can provide uh, renewable energy uh, as much as possible in to meet our needs, uh, just like we've done at multiple bus depots across the city, multiple council libraries and multiple community facilities. So we're continuing to do everything we can to reduce our electricity use, but there are certain things coming that will increase that use, particularly switching towards electric vehicles and electric buses, which we know uh, will come very much in the coming years. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, we currently purchase renewable energy through existing arrangements for green power uh, and uh, also uh, renewable energy certificates for large market sites which use grid electricity. Uh, the market has matured and evolved in the years since Council last went out to market and uh, so it's appropriate that we renew that arrangement. Item B is uh, the claim for compensation and advance payment for the resumption of land located at 110 Shelley Road, Colo, for bushland purposes. Uh, now, this is part of our ongoing acquisition of bushland across the city to protect it for the future, to protect it for our residents and for our wildlife uh, and uh, for the benefit of the city of Brisbane going forward. Uh, it's part of a program that has seen more than 4,000 hectares of bushland preserved across the city. Land that, if it wasn't for uh, the bushland acquisition program would have uh, little bit by little bit been eaten away uh, for other purposes and the livability of our city would have suffered as a result. Uh, and so this particular acquisition is just another example of how we're serious about protecting our bushland biodiversity, particularly in areas where there is already existing bushland reserves and corridors that need protecting. Uh, and Colo is definitely one of those areas. Uh, I think... Um, Councillor Adam, and you'll be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we own most of Colo, uh, and um, uh, little bit by little bit, we've been acquiring land there uh, to make sure we preserve that for the future. Right. This particular one is 159 hectares. 159 hectares, that is a massive site of land, uh, and is really important because it's near, uh, it's part of the wildlife corridor, which connects the Diagula National Park and, land, and Lake Manchester, with the Brisbane River Corridor as well, and Ipswich's Sapling Pocket Nature Reserve. So it's part of a much bigger network of bushland biodiversity. Uh, we have a goal of 40% of our natural habitat cover across the city uh, being achieved, or 40% natural bushland or habitat cover by 2031. And we're currently setting at 38.9% uh, on the way to achieving this target. We've got 1,200 more hectares required to achieve this goal and purchasing this large 159 hectare site in Colo is an important part of getting on with achieving that goal. Uh, obviously there's been, um, you'll see in the, the paperwork, there's been um, various, uh, I guess, negotiations that uh, we've attempted to make uh, with the property owner. There's a disagreement over uh, the price of acquisition uh, and what we're doing here is uh, we're paying an advance uh, for the land based on what we believe it is worth, uh, based on the assessments and reports that we've had. And then we will continue to negotiate on whether there's any additional payments uh, that will be made to the property owner. So rather than the property owner uh, getting nothing at this point, uh, we will pay them the full amount of what we believe based on our reports to be the value of the land. And then we'll continue to negotiate and work with the owner uh, on whether any further uh, compensation is payable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, I'll speak on both these items and ask that they be taken seriatim for voting, please. 
Items A and B, Sarah Yardin for voting. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Just starting on uh, item A, which is the um, stores board submission for the supply of electricity. Um, what we see in this contracting plan is a prediction of council's electricity usage to increase by 50%, which is um, an astronomical increase in terms of power consumption, uh, particularly given the size of Brisbane City Council. Um, but what is completely absent from the contracting plan before us is any policy for shifting this consumption to renewables. Um, we're spending an estimated $360 million over 10 years, but can't invest any of that money uh, into specifically into renewable initiatives. Um, so what we have before us is a very lazy policy from this LNP council administration. Uh, the LNP mayor's plan is to consume more and buy more, and that's about it. Uh, it's certainly not a sustainable approach. It's not a plan uh, that uh, uh, it's not a plan that council's reliance on fossil fuel generated power will be reduced over the long term. The plan is to just crank up the dial um, to deal with consumption. Uh, council would have to be one of the single largest consumers of electricity in Brisbane. Uh, and in this submission to buy electricity, this LNP administration is only talking about other people creating renewable energy as if the, the market just sort of operates all entirely on its own and is not um, driven by demand. Uh, particularly when it comes to demand for renewable energy. But that's um, pretty much the LNP way. We've uh, seen the same lack of leadership uh, from the LNP's colleagues down in Canberra. And we already have prospects for community batteries here in Brisbane. Uh, this plan should be talking about things like that. Uh, Federal Labor announced there's going to be a community battery in Cooparoo, for instance, if they win the next election. Uh, which will power um, hundreds of homes and store renewable energy uh, just from one battery alone. Now, as the largest council in Australia, we need to be thinking bigger and we need to be thinking local. Uh, how can we as an organisation produce and store our own renewable energy instead of relying on other levels of government to do the heavy lifting? Uh, once again, Chair, this LMP administration here in City Hall have, have delivered a do-nothing policy uh, creating problems for others to fix. Uh, there is a total lack of creativity uh, and leadership from this current LNP administration. In here, it also talks about council's carbon neutral commitment. Uh, the only commitment we see from the LNP when it comes to carbon neutrality is buying uh, cheap overseas carbon credits. Uh, and not only that, but this council doesn't include landfill as a source of emissions. If we had uh, well, and landfill is, of course, one of the biggest contributions to greenhouse gas emissions anywhere in the world, particularly for our local government. And that's why uh, Labor is fighting uh, for this council to introduce a full FOGO service, uh, not just uh, a small um, token trial of that service, uh, but a full FOGO service to take kitchen scraps out of landfill, compost them and reduce the amount of methane they produce when breaking down in landfill. Uh, there is a lot that has been left, a lot left to, uh, to be desired from this pol policy chair. Uh, it's weak, uh, but not surprising considering uh, this administration that's currently in charge, uh, very much out of ideas. Uh, clause B is a rejection of the claim for an advance payment for, uh, and for an advance payment for the resumption of land located at Shelley Road, Colo. Uh, the, here in the papers before us is a rejection of a claim of compensation and payment of that um, uh, advance for the resumption of this land for bushland. Uh, so what we see here is the LNP entering a negotiation to buy bushland, but only, um, of course, doing it when it suits themselves. Uh, we've seen uh, previous purchases of bushland being politically motivated, uh, like those bare, small, cleared house blocks at Mount Gravatt, purchased to help, help Councillor Adams hold on to her marginal ward, uh, when it comes to land that sits in a critical wildlife corridor uh, that's home to a number of native and threatened species and under serious threat of being developed, uh, this LNP administration refuses to buy it. Uh, today, we should also be discussing that resumption, that 415 to 427 Beckett Road, Bridgman Downs. Uh, but the LNP mayor and local LNP councillor, Tracy Davis, seem to be turning their backs uh, um, on that community and turn their backs on buying that genuine piece of bushland uh, and we're likely to see it lost to developers. 
Uh, so when it comes to, you know, the, the Lord Mayor talks in great big platitudes about protecting green space uh, and protecting bushland, uh, and he talks a big game, uh, Chair, but when it comes to actually delivering on this, when he talks about providing green space uh, East Brisbane, he's actually delivering bitumen car parks. Um, when he talks about purchasing bushland, uh, we know uh, that more often than not that is politically motivated uh, and those those blocks are not genuine bushland when genuine bushland, like a Brisbane Downs, uh, is left to the developer's bulldozer. Brisbane deserves much better. We're doing it, Carl. Thank you. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, just um, uh, briefly on items A and items B. I'll just start with item B. Um, I don't support item B and I won't be voting for it. Um, I'm extremely concerned about the information contained in the council papers today, um, most of which is redacted and we can't actually speak about it. Um, but as the Lord Mayor sort of passed across, uh, the, uh, there is a huge um, disconnect between what the owner of this land wants and uh, what council is willing to pay. Um, and I think going further uh, at this stage is enormously uh, problematic. So um, that is the, the, the financial um, issues are of great concern. Also of concern to me um, is the fact that uh, again, it's LMP areas that are uh, uh, being um, uh, being bought back. Uh, we know um, there's been substantial criticism um, by um, the Auditor General about Council's handling of uh, the bushland levy, um, with 95% of uh, all the funding being allocated in LMP wards. And, you know, you'd think that there's only bushland in those wards, which is fundamentally untrue. Um, we have had significant tracts of bushland in Oxley, um, in other suburbs in my area. Uh, council's been unwilling to uh, buy them back. And in contrast, of course, three residential house blocks in Mount Gravatt were bought back. They had a couple of palm trees and a house on them. Um, so, you know, this administration does not have a good track record when it comes to the transparent and accountable use of the uh, bushland buyback levy. Um, and that is a disservice to our city. Uh, so for both of those reasons, I won't be supporting this item before us today. Um, it, it just should not be progressing given um, what I've read in the papers. And I think it is of great concern um, that this could end up going very badly uh, for council. Uh, with regards to item A, um, I think uh, Councillor Cassidy has a point here and uh, the chair will recall um, when I was his deputy chair going back you know 14 years now um, this council was looking at uh, sourcing um, its own power um, and it's something that we've gone away from and uh, council has failed to consider again. We're doing little bits which is fair to say on some council buildings uh, we are putting uh, solar panels um, that's great if we own those buildings, um, but it's certainly not a substantive uh, generation capacity for the council. Given the amount of space we have in the city, the amount of buildings we have in the city, um, our marketplace presence, our economic power, this council should be doing more uh, to be generating uh, its own power uh, back into the grid uh, to supplement council's own needs, but also to um, lessen our um, carbon footprint um, in Brisbane. And it, it's just disappointing to me that um, this seems to be just a very traditional um, approach to seeking um, to seeking uh, new uh, electricity supply. Um, it, 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 it just, I don't know why we're not putting these sorts of things out to the market to see what's possible. Uh, and it just strikes me that um, this council's not thinking in a new way about um, meeting our environmental considerations. Um, yes, this council buys offsets. Most of them are overseas. Some of them are in Australia, um, but but that's the old way of thinking. I mean, sustainability, um, you know, doesn't just mean offsets. Sustainability means looking at changing the life cycle of, of how your organisation or your business or your household works and making changes, um, you know, within that 
um, within that environment. And that's where council has missed the ball. So um, I don't think that this... Um, I don't think that this stores board submission uh, for the supply of electricity actually will meet the city's uh, future needs. Um, I think it's probably old world thinking uh, and we should absolutely be looking at how council can be more sustainably generating power. Now, some, some ways we might be able to do that. Um, certainly, I think uh, we should be looking at any building that we're going into um, or we have a lease on. Uh, is looking at um, uh, renewable energy as part of our lease agreements uh, with those buildings. We have significant market power and we need to be exercising that. Um, council needs to be uh, looking more carefully uh, at uh, its building program to make sure uh, its building program uh, includes uh, sustainability uh, from an electricity generation point of view. Um, that's not always the case. Um, and at the moment, of course, there is some retro uh, fitting on council buildings, but we should be identifying every single council building. Um, our The agencies we work with should be looking at how we can generate solar power. Um, you know, the CBIC, um, Oxley Creek Transformation, there are so many ways in which we should be looking at um, generating renewable energy as part of the supply for our city. Um, it, it's disappointing to me that, uh, you know, um, that we don't have standards for all new buildings, um, whether they're residential, commercial, uh, for solar panels on roofs. I appreciate that would mean a change to state government legislation as well uh, to the Queensland Development Code um, and, and other legislation. But the big issue here is, of course, um, that council has significant marketplace power in Brisbane. Um, we can influence good outcomes and we should be asking for them as part of our basic conditions um, with respect to new buildings and uh, with respect to leasing. Um, you know, the shopping centre that my office is based in um, uh, was built with council as a foundation tenant. Um, here at Fairfield, I mean, the amount of roof space we've got is phenomenal. So, you know, we should be looking at making sure these things are, are properly addressed as part of our uh, economic power within the leasing uh, environment as well. Um, of course, there are other you know, other ways in which um, we can be looking at waste uh, is another one. And councils dabbled a little bit in this, in, um, you know, methane and in, in turning methane into energy. Um, again, we should be looking at this in a more substantive way. Um, certainly uh, through our landfill uh, issues and with all of our partners. Uh, and I think that there is more we can do in that space. So to me, um, this council is marking time with old thinking and it really needs to be rethinking uh, sustainability and electricity supply. And this seems to me to be a lost opportunity to do that. Councillor Johnson, further speakers? Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Mr Chair. I wish to speak on item A, the significant contracting plan for the supply of electricity. Now, I would like to say from the outset that we continue to work on reducing our electricity requirements and new solar installations. You know, Mr Chair, we have the smartest minds in this space working for Council, and I'm really proud of the teams that are looking at all the options. But specifically, back to the SCP, we currently have two contracts relating to the two categories for Council sites. Category one is for small sites, which consume less than 100 megawatt hours per year. And category two is for large market sites, for facilities which consume more than 100 megawatt hours per year. And that includes our street lighting as well. Both current contracts expire on the 30th of June this year. The estimated expenditure for this proposed corporate procurement arrangement is $350 million over 10 years. And as the Lord Mayor said, central to the approach is to ensure that we continue to purchase renewable energy. And this will only supplement the, our own renewables which are generated. This is in line with uh, the Shrina Council's long-standing commitment to carbon neutrality. And I'll get to some of the claims from the opposition in a moment. We are Australia's largest carbon neutral government, and we are so proud of that. And it kills the opposition every single day. 
We are looking to combine the generated electricity component and the renewable energy certificates into a single green energy contract. Currently, we use a 100% green power product for category one and purchase certificates to offset the non-renewable component of grid electricity purchased in category two. Through this process, we are considering alternatives and uh, looking at different types of approaches that we might need into the future, such as entering into a power purchase agreement with a renewable energy generator. Now, as part of our local buy procurement policy, there'll be a 30% local benefits waiting for this evaluation and tenders must have and maintain a current Queensland electricity retailer's license for the duration of the contract term. Every time we talk about carbon neutrality, Councillor Cassidy claims that landfill is not captured and it's not part of carbon neutrality. It absolutely is, Councillor Cassidy, and it's proudly written on our website as well. So in summary, Mr Chair, we're looking for the best outcome for our ratepayers, the best outcome for the environment and the best outcome for our local economy. Thank you, Councillor Cunningham. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Sri. Thanks, Chair. Um, I did find some of the commentary that other councils have made quite interesting and um, I share those concerns about power generation and, and the extent to which we're buying quote unquote green energy versus generating our own locally. I realise there's a lot of complex issues in, wrapped up in this, but I would be interested um, quite sincerely in some more detailed reflections from the Lord Mayor about why we aren't looking more seriously at actual at running council power, solar power plants. Um, I'm aware, for example, that Sunshine Regional Co Council has, has a solar power plant. I realise that um, they are quite space intensive in, at times, but I'm also mindful that council does have a lot of underutilised land or sites that could serve a dual purpose. Um, I'm thinking also about some of the large Queensland urban utilities blocks of land uh, where it, it might not actually be too difficult to install solar panels above or on, on top of other facilities and, and services that are, are using those sites. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to waste time trying to tell the LNP to do a better job of uh, addressing global warming. I think we all know where the party stands on that front at the macro level. They're effectively climate deniers and they're dooming us to a, a pretty pretty bleak future with the current policy platform of supporting new coal mines. But at, at, at the very least, I'd be interested in the Lord Mayor's reflections on exactly what it is that's stopping us setting up more solar power plants within Brisbane City Council. And I know that historically, Brisbane City Council actually ran a number of coal power plants back in the day. And um, I figure if, if we could do that once upon a time, why can't the council run some solar generation power plants of a, of a slightly more significant scale going forward. So hopefully the mayor will give me the respect of, of her brief answer on that question. Thanks. Thank you. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you to the councillors uh, who contributed to the debate. Uh, some interesting points raised there and um, uh, it's interesting because uh, we, we saw once again uh, the leader of the opposition had his prepared speech that someone else wrote for him and he didn't actually listen to what was said or understand the submission or understand what we do. Uh, he just read his prepared political speech. Um, but, you know, I guess once again, um, I'm disappointed but not surprised. Uh, when it comes to what we're doing, yes, we are focusing on making sure we reduce our energy use all um, to, across Brisbane to the extent we can. Uh, and that includes even things like um, replacing street lights uh, from the old school bulbs to, sol uh, to LED lights, uh, to do energy efficiency audits on all of the buildings that we own and work with community groups to do that, to roll out so solar panels on as many council buildings as possible and to support organisations rolling out solar panels uh, where there's a lease site. Uh, we also, and we have been for years, capture landfill gas and we generate green energy from that gas. Uh, one of the, uh, I guess, um, interesting things about being the Council for Channel Award for uh, many years was that uh, I... Not enough. The... We need more. 
Councilman Johnston, Johnston, please. The big Rochdale landfill uh, within my ward. And uh, there was many times I had the opportunity to go out there and actually see the, the green power plant that we have uh, generating gas, uh, generating electricity from the landfill gas out there, green energy, feeding green energy into the grid uh, to power several thousand homes. And so that has continued. That happens also at Willowong, um, it, at the old landfill sites down near the bus depot there. Uh, so we capture wherever possible landfill gas uh, and wherever possible we're uh, generating green energy from that. That's just one of the many, many things that we do. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things um, that Labor seems to be completely unaware of, and also I think to a certain extent, Councillor Shree from his comments, is that the electric transport revolution that is coming, so electric cars, electric buses, uh, electric trucks, um, is going to generate and require much more electricity going forward. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, for our bus depots that we have, so we have 1,200 uh, buses in the fleet, give or take. If we were to overnight electrify the entire bus fleet, uh, guess how much extra electricity we would need to actually make that happen? Can anyone guess? Not you, Councillor Owen, because I know you know the answer to this, um, but can anyone else guess? Uh, we would need a enough, enough electricity to power the entire city of Gladstone just to power our bus fleet. Now, um, Councillor Shree can dabble around with solar plants, but you are never going to provide enough uh, peak load using solar power to power the city of Gladstone um, or our entire bus fleet. And so um, I'm not sure what Councillor Shree's solution to that is. Um, he obviously doesn't like coal-fired power. Um, does he like nuclear power? I don't know. Um, point of order, but the, the reality is point, point um, solar order, power point is order, not of uh, Will the mayor take a quick question? No. Will the mayor, would you take a question? No. So the, the reality is um, in order to gear up for the electric, electrification of the transport network, uh, whether it's our buses, other people's buses, other people's trucks, cars, uh, council fleet cars, um, there are going to be increasing demands for electricity. Uh, and if you can't see that coming, you're really not looking very hard. And so for Labor to criticise that there's going to be extra spend on electricity, um, they are in la-la land. Of course there is. We're coming towards an electrical revolution here uh, and transport will be uh, which is a key emitter, as we know, will be um, a real game changer when it comes to the way our city works. But this also has major ramifications to a whole range of things across the city. Um, so you think about uh, the, ha the homes and buildings that people live in um, and, you know, a lot of the apartment buildings uh, that people live in. If every person in that apartment building in a few years' time has an electric car, power network and the power grid is not going to be able to cope with the extra demand. And so, uh, yes, there will be a need for more power to be generated. Yes, we want to do that wherever possible with uh, sustainable and renewable electricity sources, but there is going to be an increasing need for electricity because uh, we'll see a move away from diesel uh, emitting vehicles, uh, from petrol emitting vehicles to electrical vehicles, which will need to be charged. Now, we know what um, Labor councillors think about electric vehicles because they uh, got triggered when they saw one being advertised in King George Square just recently. Uh, fantastic new uh, electric vehicle model that is um, that was being displayed in King George Square. Oh, my goodness, they were triggered. They, they must hate electric vehicles. They must hate sustainable transport, uh, given their reaction to that. Uh, but the reality is council is gearing up for this new uh, electrical future particularly when it comes to our transport. We're reducing uh, our demand wherever possible by putting in uh, lower energy devices and lights and a whole range of other sustainability measures. But the reality is anyone who has any idea on what's coming knows that there will be a need for more power, particularly uh, to power electric vehicles and electric buses and electric trucks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lord Mayor.
We now move on to the vote um, for the ENC report, item A. All those in favour of item A in the ENC report, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Aye. All saying no, please say so and raise your hand. No. 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 The ayes have it. We move on to item <laughs> Councillor Strunk. Division. Division, Division. Is by Councillor Strunk and Councillor Johnston. Please ring the bells. Thank you, councillors. All appear to be present. That the division is on item A in the ENC report. All in favour of item A in the ENC report, please say aye and raise your hands. Thank you. All opposed, please say no and raise your hands. No. No. Are there any abstentions? But Mr. Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 19 in favour, six against and one abstention. That motion is carried. Councillors, we now move on to the vote on item B in the ENC report. Item B, all in favour, please say aye. Raise your hands. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. Raise your hands. Any abstentions? I declare that motion carried. Division. Division called by Councillor Hutton and Councillor Division. Howard. Ring the bells. Is everyone here? Ring the bells. Thank you, councillors, all appear to be here. Councillors, the division is on item B in the ENC report. All in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Any opposed, please say no, raise your hands. Any abstentions? Thank you. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 24 in favour and two abstentions. Thank you, that motion is carried. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Sreen. Oh, just a quick one. Um, I understand why we, when we call a division that you ask for abstentions, but why do you ask for abstentions when you're just doing the vote on the voices? Is it necessary? Um, just in this format that we have, it makes it easier for the clerks to read what's and see what's happening. It's only for the purpose of assisting the clerks to do the counts. Thank you, councillors. We now move on to the next item before us. Deputy Mayor, um, the Economic Development and Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee report, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the minutes of the Economic Development and Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 1st of February, 2022, be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by the Deputy Mayor and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the report of the Economic Development and the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 1st of February, 2022, be adopted. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. And as we do at the start of every um, session for our committee, we got an update from our Economic Development Manager, Chris Isles, on the current... I'm not on, I am on mute, so I'll start that again. As, um, as, I, I was, as I was saying while I was on mute at the start of each session um, for our committees, we have an economic update from our ED manager, Chris Isles, on the current status of the city. 
And unfortunately, it has been a start to the year that many of us were not hoping for or expecting. Uh, while we had no formal lockdowns, um, we are hearing that it has been the worst part of the pandemic for many of the businesses who are required to stay open, um, but with no idea when people will start getting street uh, feedback on the streets. We know they're suffering after residents were told to avoid going out as the Omicron variant spreads, and we totally understand um, why people are reluctant to go out uh, as it was spreading as well. And while prior to Christmas, things were looking very, very positive, um, almost returning to normal, latest figures across December, January period, period showed foot traffic in the Queen Street Mall was sitting at less than half of pre-COVID levels, some of the worst figures we've seen in the last month since the start of the pandemic in 2020. So many businesses that were counting on a full bumper summer season um, have had starting to make up for previous losses, um, but it didn't actually continue all the way through the summer season. And what they have seen now is further declines in trade as customers literally vanished over the, um, the January period as well. We know the Queen Street Mall is our destination shopping, um, uh, premier shopping destination, and it should be a time for locals and tourists. And unfortunately for any of those who are popping into town for meetings here and there, it is a ghost town at the moment. Hopefully with school starting this week, what we are seeing is people coming back to work and it's definitely what we are encouraging through council and through our offices as well. But small business is the backbone of economy and we realise they have been doing it tough. And that's why the Shrina Council has been determined not to let them go to the wall, which is why we stepped in with the $5 million relief package that will reach more than 5,000 businesses and community groups with a range of fees and charges waived for three months from January through to March. Um, we're hearing already the relief that this is for many businesses, everything from food safety, outdoor dining and food truck permits. Um, it could be river moorings for our tourism operators, live music fees, film permits, and of course, leasing costs for our clubs and community um, groups on council land. So we see that the average CBD restaurant with outdoor dining will save more than $1,800, while a suburban cafe who utilises their footpath could see up to a $700 waived fee in this quarter. And we know that every dollar counts when you're a small business, a community group, or a sporting club as well. So unfortunately, the uh, very uh, happy story we're looking for in our economic update did not ca carry through until 2022, but we're hoping by the time we get to the end of this quarter, school back, people back to work. Um, we And free parking announced today as well that we'll see more people coming into the CBD, the workers in particular into the CBD and people getting out and about to support their businesses right across the city so we can get back on our feet and uh, in very short term in, introduce a welcome back our international and interstate travellers to our businesses. Um, it is all about being the most small business friendly council um, in Australia and there is no apology from that from the Shrina Council and we look forward to supporting them through these initiatives, the Brisbane Business Hub, the Business Small Roundtable that we're working on to make sure that we support them in the years to come. Thank you. Councillor Adams, any further debate? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, just briefly on um, item A, a uh, couple of issues um, regarding the Brisbane economic update. Um, firstly, I think um, uh, this administration needs to realise that with more people working from home, uh, more time, uh, money and resources need to be invested into looking after our suburbs. Um, broken footpaths, um, parks that are so overgrown they can't be used. There's a mattress dumped outside Sherwood Rail Station. It's been there for a week. Um, tomorrow it'll be a week. Um, I mean, council's not picking up rubbish off the side of the street. And I understand that COVID has disrupted a lot of things, but that's been happening for two years. And obviously there needs to be uh, contingency plans uh, put in place. But fundamentally, what the LNP administration seemed to um, be getting wrong, um, and I will speculate on why in a minute, but uh, this focus on we must bring people back to the CBD, we've got to do this in the CBD, all of that's great, um, but I'll, I'll, I feel that at a time when so many other 
property um, analysts, economic analysts are saying that we need to be rethinking our CBDs in the wake of COVID because the way in which people work and live is now different and it's likely to be different um, for some years to come. Even if um, we waive fees for three months for businesses, for footpath dining or whatever it is, and that's great. I have no problem with that. Um, that's In three months' time, this the impacts of COVID are not going to have stopped. Um, we're still going to have people who are either gradually coming back to work or reluctantly coming back to work. But long term, uh, there is a huge increase in the number of people who will be working from home. Um, and that means that we need to look at where we best support them and we look at how we reinvent our CBDs. And again, I'm not hearing any of this kind of new environment thinking or being responsive to the context and implications of COVID two years on, we're hearing the same kind of responses from the LNP. Um, so I, I think that we need to be rethinking uh, where we're heading out of a practical response, um, but also because the long-term way um, that our city uh, is going to operate, and that could be two years, it could be five years, it could be 50 years, I don't know. Um, but this this migration to work from home is real. Um, it, it's spiked significantly. And even if it goes um, some way back to normal, uh, we're not going to see the same levels um, of uh, businesses in the city. So I, I just would hope that our council is having some discussions around uh, how to support um, the suburban high streets more. And I don't mean a little grant to decorate a shop front. Um, I mean real planning changes um, that, for example, stop uh, residential areas being converted into commercial or retail when there are huge... What about it to you, Councillor Adams? Um, economic development, this is no relevance to the committee presentation or my committee. Yep. Councillor Johnson, you've strayed a, a fair way from the issue before us and the subject of this debate. Can I bring you back to the committee report, please? Well, I'm, I'm talking about how people work, and this is... a like paragraph one, employment, paragraph two, employment, paragraph three, payroll, employment. So I'm, I'm talking about employment and talking I guess I'm just talking about... High street it. upgrades, maybe, maybe stretching a bit. Councillor Johnson, mm. please, back to the report. Well, yeah, I, I appreciate that I'm not saying what you want me to say and I appreciate I'm not saying what Councillor Adams is saying, but I think that's my point, isn't it? That I don't think this council's got its approach to this quite right and you know the the data that is in here about employment um, definitely telling us that there are issues and we need to be rethinking the way uh, that we operate um, so I, I just I just make the point um, you know that uh, we are we are definitely seeing some problems um, and I know council is trying to respond and doing so um, in, a, in a practical but small way, but there needs to be a broader discussion about the trends that are happening, and I don't believe that's happened, and it should. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Further debate? Any further speakers? Councillor Adams? Thank you, Mr Chair, and if Councillor Johnson ever wanted to be on my committee, or the City Planning Committee for that matter, um, she would understand the difference between economic development and city planning. However, in saying that, uh, we are looking forward to our very uh, large... Order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Johnson. I thought this was the Economic Development and Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee. I didn't realise Councillor Adams was still the Chair of City Planning. I thought that was Councillor Allen. Is that correct? Yeah. Councillor Adams, can I draw you back to the... Uh, yeah, I said... Before us, please. Thank you. I'll, I'll say it clearly again, because Councillor Johnson does not want to listen to me. I said, if she wanted to be on my committee, as we offered, or the City Planning Committee, she would realise the difference. This is Economic Development Committee. She spoke about city planning issues, two very different things. But in saying that, looking forward uh, in the coming order, months Mr. to Chair. a... Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Um, at no point was I ever offered a position on the Economic Development and Olympic Committee. Uh, was it discussed with me? Not, and... not a point. It's not a point of order, Councillor Johnston. You know that. Yeah. I would have um, thought Council Councillor Adams, Adams being dishonest was a... Councillor Johnston, please. Councillor Adams. Thank you. Councillor Johnson's made never, very clear she will never be on a committee that I chair. 
um, as I was saying, the uh, committee, our uh, economic development team and our Brisbane City Host Office are looking forward to a very in-depth uh, engagement with the community over the coming months on our City Centre Master Plan and our inner city framework, strategic framework, which will look exactly uh, what Councillor Johnson was talking about. And we've had presentations on that to see what we think the way of the new world is going to be when it comes from working in the city and working from home with regards to high streets, et cetera. That is the city planning committee, one that she has said she would not be on as well. Thank you, councillors. We now move to the vote on this report, the Economic Development and Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors. Uh, point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Landers. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when the all councils have left the meeting. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Hutton that we adjourn for an afternoon tea break for 15 minutes. Which commences when everybody has left the meeting. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. See you back here in about 15 minutes. Councillors, welcome back from afternoon tea. We have quorum. Uh, the next item is the Transport Committee report. Councillor Owen, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Transport Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 1st of February 2022 be adopted. Seconded. Seconded. Oh. Seconded there. Uh, I'll go with uh, Councillor Huang. Yeah. Seconded Second. by, by Councillor Owen and seconded by Councillor Huang that the report of the Transport Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 1st of February 2022 be adopted. Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair. For our first committee meeting of the year, officers delivered a very informative presentation on Brisbane's two newest ferry terminals. And I know Councillor Howard was very excited with the one down at Howard Smith Wharf. So late last year, we saw construction completed on the new terminals at both South Bank and Howard Smith Wharves. Now, particularly for those people who are living close to the river, we know that ferries are a critical part of the transport port network, as well as the Brisbane lifestyle. With both terminals opening just before Christmas last year, the timing was perfect for residents and visitors to hop on a city cat and explore two of the most sought after destinations in our city. At that time, it was a little bit different to usual with the impacts of COVID, but there still was a considerable amount of interest um, besides that, that situation. The presentation last week actually showed us how these two terminal upgrades are helping to improve the accessibility and connectivity of our city. South Bank Ferry Terminal is one of the busiest in our network and the old terminal had consisted of two separate pontoons that had been in operation since 1996. Now, upgrading this very important piece of infrastructure has simplified the terminal, changing it into a single larger pontoon. The new terminal has also improved access for passengers, now offering a single arrival and departure point, which makes it a lot easier to transfer between services. There is also a bigger waiting area and improved accessibility, including extra seating and rest zones for people with mobility impairment, as well as easily accessible timetables, help points and braille and tactile signage. These design features um, are bespoke elements and they, as such an open span, it has an open span roof line and an ex extended boulevard platform to link in nicely with the river walk that greets passengers as they hop off at South Bank. And in fact, it looks like um, what's called a butterfly roof line. And it allows clear vision from South Bank right across the river, which is absolutely wonderful. These terminals were designed and constructed using a more simplified approach to flood resilience by reorientating the gangways parallel to the river flows. At Howard Smith Wharves, the brand new terminal has better integrated the precinct into our public transport network ensuring that residents and visitors have e easy access to this public space. 
It has also provided extra connectivity to the New Farm Riverwalk and surrounding suburbs such as Fortitude Valley and Kangaroo Point via the Story Bridge. There were a number of factors taken into consideration when selecting the terminal location, including accessibility, geotechnical engineering, and also tidal conditions. The terminal has been designed to blend into the precinct and preserve the prominence of the heritage structures. The presentation also talked us through the bespoke features, including a modified roof form to enable improved views across the Brisbane River. The best part about these two terminals is that they help support local industry and over 100 local jobs. Many local suppliers right across the city contributed parts towards the two terminals, and we are proud to say that this infrastructure was made by the people of Brisbane and for the people of Brisbane. The process of building infrastructure provides many opportunities to stimulate the local economy and create local jobs. And this is what the Shrena Council aims to do. Mr Chair, I would like to finish by thanking everyone who worked hard on these terminals last year. Not only our exceptional council officers, but also the local suppliers who I just mentioned. In light of the challenges at both sites, not to mention the extra complexities presented by COVID-19 and supply chain impacts, the timely completion of these two terminals is an outstanding achievement. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Further speakers? Are there any further speakers on a Transport Committee report? I see no one with a hand up. We'll now move straight to the vote. All in favour, please say aye. Raise your hands. Aye. Any no's, please say so and raise your hands. I declare that motion carried. Councillor Wines, Infrastructure Committee Report, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated uh, the Tuesday, the 1st of February 2020, be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Wines and seconded by Councillor Matic that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 1st of February 2022, be adopted. Councillor Wines. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Briefly to the uh, subject of the report, uh, it was the BMTMC, uh, an entity familiar to most of us, I'm sure, and how it operates remotely and how it's continued to provide support for the people of Brisbane um, during the pandemic. Uh, as many would know, the, BC, the BMTMC has a facility here in Brisbane Square where they can monitor a whole range of um, intersections and traffic flow uh, using uh, a series of I suppose, television sets. Uh, now we had to transfer a range of those activities uh, because of the pandemic and uh, the result was discussed as part of our report. Uh, the BMTMC was opened in 2006 to deliver a safe and predictable traffic and transport operational services. Uh, it's about improved intelligence gathering, accurate and timely traveller information, integrated incident and event management, optimised traffic and transport uh, network and improved safety and predictability. And we work together with the Department of Transport and Main Roads, the Queensland Police Service, the RACQ and the Australian Road Network to ensure that our road network uh, responds to incidents and maintains a, a uh, traffic flow um, through both predicted and not predicted events. Uh, so, uh, for example, a predicted event would be, say, uh, a football match or a cricket match at the Gabba that would require uh, traffic controls and increased anticipated uh, pedestrian and motor vehicle movements towards a particular venue. Um, and not predicted or unpredicted events would have been, for example, today's uh, march by the CFMEU up George Street. Uh, however, the BT BMTMC is able to respond to both and, as a result, uh, maintain traffic flow around these events while allowing um, those people participating in them to stay safe uh, and for the event to occur. Uh, so um, the report spoke to a range of matters within traffic flow within the city and provided quite a amount of detail on how COVID had actually impacted the style uh, and of traffic movement and had basically uh, changed 
the behaviour that there were no longer um, morning and evening peaks, just merely a consolidation of traffic throughout the day, uh, and, and predictably fewer cars travelling across the board. Uh, the uh, TMC did monitor and manage a number of COVID-19 testing and vaccination sites, and I'm sure I wasn't alone in experiencing some of those sites uh, create a congestion point of their own because of people uh, queuing whilst in motor vehicles. Uh, however, we did respond to those. Traffic control, strictly speaking, in those instances did belong to the state government. However, we are, and the point of this presentation is to ensure that we manage the traffic um, in partnership and provide due support to uh, the state government where it is required. Uh, we are continuing to look at ways to improve that service, both through uh, how it delivers um, to, our, uh, to our staff in Debit How and how to improve the technology that supports it. Uh, the uh, committee also saw two petitions, one about a speed reduction in Bulimba and another about a uh, intersection upgrade at Fig Tree Pocket Road. I look forward to comments and contributions from my fellow councillors. Thank you, Councillor Wines. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Three, down there. Thanks, Chair. Um, I hope you're feeling well still. Yeah, still holding out. Had some Panadol, haven't, haven't fainted yet. Um, uh, yeah, appreciate the presentation from Councillor Wines. I was interested in th this content and I was disappointed I couldn't join the um, stream, but I, I, the the way that the BMTC manages um, non-planned incidents really interests me. I've obviously been involved in some protests and actions that were planned incidents and some that weren't planned. Um, but I've been struck by the fact that there have been a couple of occasions where, for example, uh, act protest organisers or event organisers have given notice to council of a road protest or a blockage where they're marching down a certain route and then the um, incident management team is in touch with the protesters and the BMTC, like those processes kick into gear um, in partnership with the police. But at no point does the council seem to notify the public of those incidents. So there have been a couple of occasions where the protest organisers have given, given written notice to council well in advance, more than five business days notice. Um, but it doesn't get recorded in, in council's standard published list of planned traffic disruptions and nor does council issue the warnings that it does for other kinds of disruptions like when they know a road's being closed for maintenance or something. Um, the one exception was the time when the Lord Mayor took me to court and lost and then the council did put out a statement saying, hey, there's going to be traffic disruption in peak hour tomorrow because of a protest. But most of the time it seems like the protesters lodge the notice council gets the heads up about it but then doesn't pass that on to the public um so i'd be interested if council lines can reflect on why is it that those protests where council has that written notice well in advance why doesn't council treat those in the same way that it treats other planned incidents where like a road is closed for road work or or whatever it seems like there's a disjunct there and i wonder why it is that we can notify the public about an upcoming road closure for road work or even for a sport event, but we can't notify the public for an upcoming road closure related to a peaceful protest. Be interested in, yeah, Councillor Wines' thoughts on that. Thank you, Councillor Three. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Cook. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Just a procedural matter for Clause B. Can I just move Seriatim for voting? Clause B, Seriatim for voting, yes. Is that it? Councillor Mackay. Uh, thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on item C, but before I do, can I point out that I have some serious internet lag here? So if I drop out or something, uh, I apologize in advance. Um, the proposed signalization of the Fig Tree Pocket Road and Kenmore Road intersection is a project that's been going on for quite some time now. In fact, the initial overtures began well before I even started in the role and the former Walter Taylor Council, who's now the federal member for Ryan, Julian Simmons, has been involved in this project for many years. 
At this point, I should thank Julian for his advocacy in getting federal government funding for this upgrade. The Shrina Council is upgrading the Fig Tree Pocket Road and the Kenmore Road intersection to address concerns raised by residents about congestion, safety and access through the local area. In 2018, Council received a petition with 389 signatures requesting traffic lights at the intersection to improve safety. Council has undertaken extensive investigations to arrive at what we uh, see as the current design. The final design is likely to be released by the end of April based on the extensive consultation conducted to this point. You may remember that I have spoken about this intersection at great length. You may remember the mum who lives nearby who keeps an emergency kit by the front door to treat accident victims who come banging on her door after they have crashed their vehicles. I've received extensive correspondence about this project and I want to put on the record one letter in particular. I won't identify the residents and I'll edit for brevity. The letter is from a dad who lives near the intersection in question. As a local resident, I was surprised at the contents of a letter that was circulated by neighbour, particularly their claims about a lack of consultation of residents. The regulation of this intersection has been keenly sought, actually petitioned for by many residents, including myself for a long time. The situation has been investigated in the most thorough degree. Detailed alternative proposals were put to residents by Councillor Mackay some time ago and the commencement of works has been foreshadowed for many months now. Quite simply, the signalisation of a Roji Place intersection is an urgently needed traffic safety measure. I do not feel it is being overly dramatic to say that something needs to be done as soon as possible to address the high incidence of collisions at that place before someone is killed. Against this, the convenience of residents is a lesser consideration, but as far as convenience is concerned, the residents of Oroji Place and Dorney Place will benefit greatly from being able to safely negotiate the intersection by vehicle. This is at present something of a haphazard affair, given the confusion about giving way of vehicles approaching on Fig Tree Pocket Road, a situation that is compounded by tourists travelling from Lone Pine who may be unfamiliar with Queensland road rules. Residents will also have the benefit of a much needed regulated pedestrian crossing on Fig Tree Pocket Road. Finally, whatever inconveniences it may impose, I also imagine that not having a serious car accident occurring outside their homes on a regular basis will significantly improve the amenity of those residents living close to the intersection. And that's the end of the letter and to some specific points in the petition. The realignment of the intersection to include a Roji place will allow residents to enter and exit the residential estate more safely with full access in and out of the street rather than the current left in left out arrangement. Further pedestrian crossing facilities and new footpaths will enhance pedestrian safety and connectivity to bus stops and the local area. The upgrade will widen Kenmore Road and the northern leg of Fig Tree Pocket Road to incorporate a de dedicated right turn pocket to separate the through and turning traffic. The additional right turn pockets will allow motorists to safely wait for a green arrow without impeding through traffic. In response to residents' feedback about congestion during the morning peak, Council is also undertaking a review of parking on the northern side of Kenmore Road and Fig Tree Pocket Road between Fig Tree Pocket Road and Aylesby Street, separate to the intersection upgrade. It's true that some vegetation will be removed for this intersection upgrade, but I'm thrilled that council officers have committed to investigate how two large figs at the entrance to a rogi place could be saved and they've committed to keeping vegetation loss at a minimum where possible. I'm told the project team investigated multiple design options for this upgrade and I'm thrilled that interested residents took the time to propose alternative designs. There was a suggestion to install a roundabout instead of traffic lights. Engineers say a roundabout is not a viable option as this would require considerable land acquisition of private properties. Realigning Fig Tree Pocket Road to the east of the current intersection to form a T intersection as an alternative was ruled out because it would require extensive works on private property drainage work and more tree removals. It is smart, sensible and responsible government to minimise land acquisition and impact to private property owners wherever possible. 
I look forward to seeing this project completed as the upgrade will allow safer and more controlled movements compared with two misaligned, unsignalized intersections. But before then, I thank everyone for being so involved in the consultation process and their help in forming the designs to date. I hope residents who want more information take the time to contact the project team at their convenience. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, just very briefly on item um, C, um, I, I just note that um, yet again in a marginal LMP seat, there is a, a gold-plated um, solution uh, for, I think, by the look of what I can see, maybe 40 residents, maybe 50 at most. Um, I don't know how many people have died at this intersection or what the crash history is, um, but uh, unfortunately, the intersection of Venner Road, Waterton Street and Ipswich Road, Annerley, um, has caused a death, Dr Jeff Copeland, and this council still refuses to take action on fixing an intersection that would benefit thousands and thousands of residents every single day. So my question and concern is, if 40 residents in Fig Tree Pocket can get turning lanes and traffic lights, why can't thousands of residents in Annerley? I think this shows everything that's wrong with the LNP, that they're not governing uh, for everyone, they're only governing for themselves. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Wines. Uh, thanks, Mr Chair. Uh, just in response to a couple of items there, um, the matters raised by Councillor Shree, I'm happy to consider that uh, those matters, I have to... Um, We'll need to make some investigations to determine uh, the uh, the details of what he was talking about. Um, so I will reply to those uh, into the future, um, because uh, as many people would know, if the uh, there is a planned uh, protest, uh, people like the BMTMC are advised as is the QPS. So I will have a discussion with some people to to, to determine uh, the mechanisms around that. Uh, can I also uh, thank Councillor Mackay for his contribution? Uh, it was a fulsome contribution. Uh, my view is that that uh, intersection um, upgrade is necessary, uh, particularly in the evening. It is uh, it is a very dark place. It's very close to the uh, Western Freeway. It services a large number of residents. is a common uh, traverse between the Western Freeway and Mogul Road and Chapel Hill generally, uh, as well as during the day the uh, tourist attraction that is uh, Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. I look forward to um, being able to deliver this for the people of the Western suburbs, a, a much needed and necessary road improvement that will make people get home sooner and safer and make our road network more safe and efficient. Thank you, councillors. Yeah. Thank you, councillors. We now move to the vote on the Infrastructure Committee report, items A and C together, items A and C. All in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no. Raise your hands. The ayes have it. Item B, which was in seriatim, item B, all in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Any opposed, please say no and raise your hands. No. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division, Division. Court, Councillor Cook and Councillor Strunk. Please, is everyone here? Ring, ring the bells. Ring the bells. Thank you, councillors. The division is on item B in the Infrastructure Committee report. 
All in favour of item B, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. No, Steve, what are you doing? <laughs> Any opposed, please say no, raise your hands. No. no. <laughs> Are there any abstentions? Yeah, I'll abstain on that one. Thank you, clerks. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 19 in favour, uh, six against and one abstention. Clear, item B, carried. Councillors. Councillors. Uh, Councillor Allen, the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee report, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the report of the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 1st of February 2022, be adopted. Second that. Being moved by Councillor Allen and seconded by Councillor Hammond that the report of the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 1st of February 2022, be adopted. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In uh, last week's committee meeting, we had a really informative presentation on the uh, Development Services 2021 Year in Review, and it was certainly uh, a year with uh, a lot of activity, as I'll touch upon shortly. So um, basically from the outset in 2021, Development Services saw very significant uh, development application levels, and uh, that continued uh, right throughout the year. And obviously, in addition to um, the development applications, they also had um, a range of other council provided services that are delivered through that branch. So uh, certainly a, a very busy year for them. And just to give you an indication of some of the statistics, they uh, received 5,082 development applications. They completed 4,319 siting variations. There were 671 planned ceiling applications being decided. And uh, a number that I found quite staggering, there were 54,038 plumbing inspections completed. In addition to these uh, particular activities, there were 55 talk to a planner sessions, which obviously assisted uh, potential applicants across the city with their building and construction plans. Uh, additionally, our dedicated planning information officers fielded 27,734 telephone inquiries. And obviously this is a, a relatively small team that um, supported those uh, phone calls. And so I'd like to acknowledge uh, their efforts during the year. The uh, presentation also touched upon Council's uh, Risk Smart service for low risk development applications. Um, during the year, the process was reviewed and subsequently renewed to ensure that is a more um, open, flexible and accessible model for everybody. And that's certainly something that's been well received by the industry. Another service that was uh, reviewed and finessed was uh, Council's pre-lodgement services. And uh, this suite of services was updated and was also uh, well received by uh, those people who utilize that particular service. So um, a really stellar year for um, development services in 2021. Uh, the way that um, the year finished, and the way that 2022 has started, it would appear that they're also in for a, uh, a very busy year in 2022. And I wish them all uh, the best for their efforts uh, during this coming year. Thank you. Thank you. Any further debate? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I rise to speak on item A just very briefly. Um, it is absolutely fascinating to see some of these statistics uh, uh, because they, they are quite useful. And I guess I have um, a few questions that perhaps Councillor Allen would like to answer. And I'll just flag now that if he ignores me, like all the LMP councillors do, um, I'll just put him on notice. And for all the council officers who are listening, Councillor Allen could do this for you now, but if he's going to make you do it, well, I'm sorry, that's his fault. So um, I just want to know um, there were 4,319 citing variations or concurrent agency applications uh, that were processed by council in 2021. I'd like to know how many of those council were refused. Um, it's been my observation over 14 years um, that this council refuses none or 
you know, if they refused any, it would be a handful of them is my feeling. Uh, so um, whilst a lot of these sighting variations uh, have been put through, um, the big issue is how many of them is this council thoroughly assessing uh, and refusing where things like zero setbacks are allowed or in a low density residential area, um, you know, a less than four metre front setback are allowed, um, you know, over 9.5 metres and, you know, um, within boundary lines and things like this. So there are lots and lots of issues here. And I regularly receive distressed phone calls from residents saying um you know that uh they don't understand the process it's very complex for them um and two they don't trust the advice that they were given um and they uh, asked me to return their forms so i can see that people are objecting uh to um these relaxations um but it's pretty clear to me that council uh isn't um uh, actioning them or changing them or requesting the developer to change them. So my question is, of the 4,319 citing variations that were approved in or processed in um, 2021, how many were actually refused? Uh, and certainly uh, I appreciate that um, Councillor Allen may need to take it on notice, but I will absolutely be following up. And again, to the officers, just say he could tell me, um, uh, the other thing I just want to put on the record is um, there are just over 5,000 DAs uh, processed by council, or just under actually, uh, 4,952 were decided in 2021. Now, Councillor Adams often makes the unsubstantiated claim, as does the Lord Mayor, and I've heard them say it repeatedly in here, that I oppose all DAs. Um, now, that's just fundamentally uh, untrue. Um, however, I do probably get, I'd, I'd be guessing around 400 of these, so probably pretty close to, you know, 8 to 10% of all DAs come through Tennyson Ward. And for the councillors like me, like Councillor Shree, um, and there are many other councillors um, who get a lot of DAs, um, we do take the time to have a look at them. Um, the process has been made that much harder um, by the changes to City Plan 2014 that I did not support, um, which allowed code accessibility of many uh, DAs. And it's incredibly disappointing um, that this administration uh, did that because it is undermining the integrity of uh, this council's planning scheme. It's leading to poor outcomes uh, and it's leading to inconsistency in decision-making with community expectations. Um, and when I explain it to people, they, they become they're very switched on about why you can build a huge childcare centre in a low density area next to a house. Um, but my issue I want to put on the record here is um, I I I am um, I'd say approximating here, but I'd say I respond to about twenty five percent of uh, all. Uh, DAs that come through and either put in comments or um, object. Now, sometimes those comments relate to problems that I think can be fixed, and I'm very clear about um, where council should be working with uh, the um, applicant to make some changes, um, particularly when it comes to character houses. I think council's planning scheme has absolutely let um, the gorgeous traditional suburbs in my area down by allowing modern boxes to be built in the middle of character suburbs. Um, uh, but equally, um, now the very small amount of impact accessible DAs uh, that do come through, um, I do make fairly um, substantive um, submissions on. So I just place on the record that, that um, the Lord Mayor and the Deputy Mayor's comments about me are just utterly, utterly false. Um, they are uninformed. Um, uh, and, you know, it'd be roughly 25% of DAs um, that I provide feedback on. I've always done that in consultation with the uh, assessment manager for South Region and there have been three in my time and I've just spoken to the new one to welcome her aboard and just run through some logistics issues. Um, but this absolute rubbish um, that the Deputy Mayor and the Mayor go on about um, is untrue. Um, I will point absolutely... Point of order, Mr Chair. A point of order to you, Councillor Adams. I know I haven't spoken on this, but I absolutely claim to be misrepresented. This is an outrageous lie, and I do not purport that I ever said that. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Uh, Councillor Johnston, 
Councillor Adams isn't mentioned in this report at all. I do bring you back to the report. Uh, you should only mention and talk to the issues that are contained within this report, please. I think it's pretty clear that, again, um, yeah. I'm talking to... Point of order, Lord Mayor. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't talked about this matter at all. I, mean, I claim to be misrepresented. I haven't said anything <laughs> about Councillor Johnson. I'll, I'll take both those points of misrepresentation for response. Mr Chairman, I just draw your attention to the fact that both the Deputy Mayor's um, point of order and the Mayor's point of order are not supported by the meeting's local law, um, that you should rule them out of order as they're not appropriately yes. made points of order under the meeting's local law. They haven't I, spoken, they haven't been misrepresented they can speak. Um, and they should not be allowed to interrupt me uh, because that is contrary to the meeting's local law. And also contrary to meeting's local law is speaking to issues that aren't contained within the report. Please confine your, your comments Mr. to what's Mr Chairman, the I'm report. seeking a ruling on whether or not the Deputy Mayor and the Lord Mayor have made valid points of order under the meeting's local law. You have appeared to allow them to make it and the meeting's local law do not allow them to do so. So again, I'm seeking a ruling on the matter that I have raised as you are the chairperson of council. Okay, thank you, Councillor Johnson. I'll take your point, you are correct. Um, Council Lord Mayor and Deputy Mayor, uh, as you not, have not spoken in, in this debate, uh, you cannot uh, move a claim to have been misrepresented. However, the option still remains for you to speak in this debate. Right. Point of now, order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Lord Mayor. Did I just hear Councillor Johnson complaining that she had been interrupted? Is that correct? Um, I do believe those words were used, I Lord Mayor, yes. She's the person who interrupts every time I speak, oh, every wow. single time I speak. Interesting. It's not a valid point of order. Yeah, Lord Mayor, that, that isn't a valid point of order, I'll point out, but you do have the option to speak if you do so wish. And when I do interject, Mr Chairman, you have a go at me. Um, but you are letting the Deputy Mayor and the Lord Mayor um, engage in this process without admonishing him. And that is my concern. And I thank you for clarifying that I was correct. Um, so let me be clear. I think the Deputy Mayor is just interrupting. I think she still wants to be planning chairperson, but um, Councillor Allen's taken over. Um, and she has done Point a of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order, Councillor Adams. I asked Councillor Johnson to come back to the report. I am not in the report. I know she loves me, but I am not in the report. I do ask you, Councillor Johnson, to return to the substance of the report before us. So just to be clear, if we can't mention other councillors in our debate about matters, um, are you going to apply that now to everyone? Because I will raise that every single time, Mr Chairperson, if another councillor is mentioned. Is that your ruling? My ruling, Councillor Johnson, is in regard to this particular item before you to ask you to come back to the matter before us as contained in the report. Well, I think everybody was pretty clear that I was talking about planning matters in 2021, and I think that was pretty apparent to anybody listening on this end of the computer. Um, but it's pretty clear that because of the um, inappropriate interjections from the Deputy Mayor and the Lord Mayor that they didn't like what I was saying. Now, my point to this is there are a huge number of DAs that come through Tennyson Ward. Um, I have been um, falsely uh, accused of opposing them all. Uh, and that is just untrue. Um, and I'm just clarifying on a matter of relevance to the report, which is simply a year in review about what uh, has happened in the development um, part of council, of which my office engages on an almost daily basis. Um, and I appreciate that that's uh, complicated and difficult for the Lord Mayor and Deputy Mayor to understand. Um, but I do take an interest in these matters. I do think there are some problems with the way in which um, Council assesses uh, the um, uh, these DAs. Uh, in my view, there needs to be uh, closer attention paid to uh, the character code. There needs to be uh, greater enforcement um, of... Uh, standards when it comes to um, the type of development that happens with regards to zoning. Um, and I certainly, again... Councillor Johnston, Allen, your time has expired. Any further speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I rise to speak on the item before us today. Can I say thank you to the team in Development Services do an absolutely outstanding role when there is over 5,000 DAs that come through 
um, our uh, council every single year with a government that changes the rules at their want as well to keep up with those rules, to keep up with the legislation and to keep up with what's going on, which I think is probably um, an issue with uh, con the consideration of the previous speakers um, citing variations that um, citing variations do not require uh, a neighbour to uh, oppose or support. Um, they are only a courtesy to let them know what it's going, but that would mean detailing we need a lead legislation and understanding what actually happens. I'd also like to say that I have never said that Councillor Johnson opposes all DAs. Uh, she opposes me, she opposes city planning, and she probably opposes Councillor Allen now, but I've never said she opposes DAs. And also I'd like to clarify, knowing the numbers of the DAs that we get through as former city planning chair, there are many, many DAs that come through council as we see. And Tennyson Ward is by far, by far, nowhere near 10%, let alone one of the busiest when it comes to DAs that come through her ward. I proudly respond to 100% of the ones that come through my ward. And uh, thank you, Council Allen, for the presentation and well done to the DS team on a hard year's work. Councillor Adams, any further speakers? No further speakers. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Look, just uh, in reference to um, Councillor Johnston's uh, uh, request regarding citing variations, that, that information isn't readily available. It's not in the presentation. Uh, it's not readily available through the council team at the moment. So um, just in the interest of using the formal council processes, I would ask her to put that as a question on notice and we'll get back to her if we can. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. We now move to the vote on this report, the uh, committee presentation for uh, development, city planning and suburban renewal committee report. All in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Any opposed, please say no, raise your hands. The ayes have it. Councillors. Councillor Davis, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee report, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 1st of February 2022, be adopted. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Davis and seconded by Councillor Mackay that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 1st of February 2022, be adopted. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mr Chair. On Tuesday, our committee presentation was on the recently released Brisbane off-road cycling strategy. And earlier in question time, I gave an overview of the off-road cycling strategy, which will guide future investment in off-road cycling facilities within natural areas and parks across our city. The strategy aims to address the demands of a diverse range of outdoor recreation users with a variety of experiences whilst also protecting and managing natural area values. And this is all part of the Sharina Council's commitment to creating a clean and green Brisbane that is livable and sustainable for future generations. Um, item B was a petition containing 25 signatures requesting Council construct a boardwalk along the Wynnum Manly Esplanade. Uh, the local councillor, Councillor Cumming, uh, supported the recommendation. Uh, and item C was a petition uh, containing 44 signatures requesting council install public toilets at Hardcastle Park, Hawthorne, near the Hawthorne Ferry term Terminal, and the local councillor, Council Cook, um, has supported the recommendation. I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Thank you. Is there further debate? Councillor Cumming. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, the uh, item B uh, is the petition calling for a boardwalk from Cambridge Parade Manly to the southern end of uh, Wynnum Manly Yacht Club. Uh, there were 25 signatures on the petition. It was headed by a Wakerley resident. Now, the, the Esplanade from Cambridge and the northern end of Winner Manly Yacht Club has a concrete footpath on, on or very close to the seawall. So one might wonder why we need a boardwalk as well. Regardless, I'm happy to see this project listed for future funding as well as the work on the seawall. And uh, I am aware that some uh, parents who push prams uh, along the, that section of the Esplanade would like to see wider pathways through the area whether they be uh, the uh, existing pathway or a boardwalk. So I support uh, Council's uh, response to this petition. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Adaman. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on item A in support of the Schrinner Council's off-road cycling strategy. Uh, this is a subject in which I have a considerable interest given that Mount Cutha Reserve has an extensive network of diverse tracks and trails. In addition to Mount Cutha, the strategy also includes future opportunities in 11 other parks and reserves in the Pullen Bar Ward. More about those later. Our chair, our chair, let me start by commending the work of the Environment Chair, Councillor Davis, and her predecessor, Councillor Cunningham, on their tireless efforts in bringing this strategy to fruition. We said from day one, and it remains the case today, that our off-road cycling strategy was about striking a balance between allowing certain uses on authorised tracks, while at the same time ensuring the protection of the city's unique and important environmental ass assets. Our Chair, this strategy identifies potential and uh, short and long-term opportunities for developing off-road cycling facilities across the city, including existing shared use tracks and fire trails. At the time of developing the strategy, authorised off-road cycling opportunities within council bushland reserves mainly comprised riding mountain tracks on designated single uh, 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 mountain bikes on designated single tracks and a skills track in the Mount Cutha Reserve. Such is the growth and popularity of off-road cycling, both as a fitness activity involving the entire family and as a highly competitive and popular sport, the 24 kilometres of designated bike trails at Mount Cutha are often at capacity. As the report to Council's Environmental Committee last week indicated, the increase in demand has added to the creation of unauthorised and illegal tracks, not only at Mount Cutha, but in other areas. New tracks can cause environmental damage and are costly to close and rehabilitate. Increasing compliance through education has been highlighted as an important <laughs> step required to minimise impacts to natural areas while rider numbers continue to increase. The popularity of off-road cycling activities was also borne out in the responses received during the second round of public consultation last year. Of the uh, uh, more than 3,200 responses received, 89% supported the development of additional off-road cycling facilities. 80, excuse me, 87% agreed that off-road cycling should be allowed on fire tracks. 81% supported off-road cycling on shared use tracks, and there was strong support for off-road cycling opportunities to be depicted on regional maps. Chair, the strategy introduces a dedicated trail care program coordinator whose role it is to develop a citywide off-road cycling trail care program and to promote community stewardship. Last year, on a very hot and steamy Saturday morning, I was invited to walk the length of Whitbird Way at Mount Cutha to see firsthand the work that 30 volunteers were undertaking to maintain that track. That day reinforced to me the importance that we continue to work in partnership with volunteer groups and community members to ensure the key outcomes of the strategy are delivered. As mentioned earlier, a number of other locations within the Pullen Vale Ward have been identified as potential future off-road cycling opportunities. They include mountain bike single trails at Gold Creek Reserve Brookfield, Changing Mountain Bushland, Dandies Road Bushland, Colo, the Colo Bushland Reserve and Shelley, and Shelley Road Park Colo. Riding on shared use trails or fire tracks at John Sprett Reserve and Prize Pocket Road at Moggle, Marstella Road Reserve, Changing Mountain Bushland and Colo Bushland Reserve and Shelley Road Park, and a skills track, dirt, uh, dirt jumps and pump track at Platypus Park, Mount Crosby and Tuckett Street Park, Kenmore. All of these identified opportunities are good fits within these reserves. The strategy says that by providing well-planned off-road cycling facilities and opportunities, we can anticipate a decrease in un unauthorised track construction and associated environmental impacts. I certainly hope that that is the case. Chair, in summary, the Schrinner Council's off-road cycling strategy provides a strategic framework for the future delivery of safe, recreational off-road cycling facilities, while at the same time better protecting our bushland reserves and parks. This strategy has my support and I look forward to its implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Adaman. Are there any further speakers? Yes. 
<laughs> oh, sorry, down there, Councillor Griffiths. There you go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just wanted to respond to the uh, off-road cycling strategy. Uh, unfortunately, last week I had difficulty um, uh, with my computer, so I wasn't able to ask some questions in committee. Um, but I might ask those questions today. Um, we have, as Labor team, some concerns regarding the Brisbane off-road cycle strategy. As we know, um, people in the conservation movement also have those concerns. We share those concerns. Um, while, and I'll stay up front, while we broadly acknowledge that there are many good parts to this strategy, uh, it is the land that is conservation land that we are particularly concerned about. Uh, and from the outset, um, we, uh, we find it strange that we have an off-road cycling strategy, but the city doesn't have a conservation strategy. And surely if you had an off-road cycling strategy that was genuine in looking at its impact in conservation areas, you would also have a conservation strategy so that the two would overlap and their information would be shared. So we are concerned about how the evidence was collected and dealt with and um, how that evidence was put together to determine which areas um, should be protected and which areas shouldn't be protected. Now, Council collects millions of dollars every year for bushland acquisition, of which we only spend, the Shrinner Council, the Shrinner LMP Council, only spends 18% um, of that money actually buying bushland. There's been many arguments in the Chamber about uh, what should be bought and what shouldn't be bought because there is never any evidence to back up how we purchase bushland and which areas we protect and not. Surely that should be based on evidence and scientific evidence that reinforces how we spend our money to buy bushland. Similarly, um, we should be using scientific evidence to determine how we're protecting bushland so that it won't be impacted by these off-road cycle users. At the moment, uh, Council offers very little protection um, for bushland uh, that is used that is used illegally uh, for off-road cycling. We don't keep up with repairs to tracks that are created often every weekend, and I can say that from Tui Forest, where officers report that there are new tracks every weekend. Um, we're not keeping up with the demand for this. We're not managing it well. We aren't spending enough money on managing it or enforcing it. And yet we're opening up more land for, uh, for the use of off-road cycling. I'm really concerned about that and I know the Labor team is. And I know many residents are concerned about our native flora and fauna and how this council is protecting it. We have to determine with our conservation areas are they for conservation or are they for recreation? And uh, I think the majority of residents would want to see them for conservation. Indeed, when we put out and say we're going to buy bushland, we don't say we're buying it uh, for recreation, for trail bike use. We say we're buying it for conservation purposes. And I suppose if you look at some examples in this strategy, and um, it was interesting that the strategy came out uh, Christmas week. So the week before Christmas, it was rele released. You know, of course, everyone's paying lots of attention to that. Um, and some people were very cynical about um, the timing of that release and the way this administration operates. But an example I'd like to give is from my local area where we have... Um, or from my side of the city, where we have uh, three significant conservation areas, and uh, it's noted in the reports, Whites Hill Reserve, we have Mount Cravat Reserve, and we have Tui Forest. All those conserve similar amounts of wildlife, similar flora and fauna, but only two of those are being totally protected. I'd like to understand and I'd like uh, the chairperson to explain to me what is the science behind protecting two of these areas but not the third area? Why have two of these areas of more significant environmental value? 
Why are we putting more effort into two of these areas, but we're opening up a third area? Why are we allowing more erosion in a Tui forest than we'll see in White's Hill or Mount Cravat Reserve? What is the science behind the decision? Unfortunately, uh, the conservation groups uh, and groups I speak to have their own views about how these decisions were made, and they don't think there is a lot of science to it, and they don't believe it has been very transparent. And I would support them on the, that, um, that logic. Uh, similarly, and I'll leave that to the chairperson, I look forward to the explanation, but why was White's Hill protected, Mount Gravatt protected, but Tui Forest not protected? Um, similarly, uh, what are, my concern relates to a number of issues, including education, the repair of, of damaged tracks and the maintenance of those tracks. We say we're going to do it by employing one officer. When this program originally started at Mount Kutha, we had one officer and it obviously hasn't worked. And then that officer was incorporated into field services, so the actual dedicated position was lost. We're now creating one officer, not just for Mount Kutha, but for the whole city. I can't see how we're going to do all the education, all the repairing, all the management that need, and enforcement that needs to be done to, to ensure these bikes, these off-road cycle users in our conservation areas don't damage them further. I remain very concerned about, um, about how this strategy be enforced in our conservation areas. And um, really, I'm looking forward to hearing a response from the chairperson in relation to the science behind how this strategy was developed, not just um, how many people put in a submission. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Griffiths. Any further speakers? Councillor Cunningham. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. I wish to speak on item A. Can I first give my thanks to Councillor Davis for continuing the work of this off-road cycling strategy. It's an important document and one which is of interest to many residents and many stakeholder groups. But specifically today, I do wanna to talk about the bushland area around Whites Hill. For those of you who don't know it, this is a relatively small section of intact bushland, which is brimming with wildlife and protected species, including home to many, many koalas. Many residents spend hours walking the paths here, exploring nature and sharing it with their family. The feeling of remoteness you can experience here at Whites Hill within its proximity to our city centre is something that we all love and want to protect. As a mum to two young boys, I do want to make sure that my children and all residents have easy access to outdoor activities and nature play. It's incredibly important that we find a balance between conservation and recreation. But regarding Whites Hill, it's clear that there is a strong community preference for the focus of outdoor recreation to be centred around walking at this location. In my experience, most people who withdraw here do it to escape the busyness of life and enjoy some quiet time either alone or with their family. That's why this location will not be considered for future bike tracks within the bushland area. Now, I know that this uh, decision has been well received by residents with an overwhelming number of people personally contacting me to support this position. A citywide strategy for off-road cycling is necessary. We have seen a huge demand for cycling tracks and it is concerning to see the creation of illegal trails in ecologically sensitive areas. You know, the easy thing to do would have been to put our head in the sand and just ignored the issue. But instead, we undertook a process which identified potential areas that are then to be subjected to an environmental assessment, a detailed environmental assessment. So I believe we have achieved a balance. I also just wanna thank Lachlan and Susan in the news branch among many others who have worked on this strategy and I do commend it to the Chamber. Thanks, Mr Chair. Thank you, any, other, any further speakers? Councillor Davis. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr Chair, and thank you to all councillors for their contribution and... Oh. Um, 
I had my hand up, Mr. Chair. I'm I'm sorry. It was definitely up to speak. Okay, my apologies, Councillor Johnson. I didn't see you. Uh, Councillor Johnson, you wish to speak in this debate? Yes, thank you. I do. My apologies, um, Councillor David. Just uh, very briefly on item A, the off-road um, cycling uh, strategy. Um, I note uh, that there have been some changes uh, to this uh, strategy, but um, and and. You know, it's it's sort of now acknowledged that it's not just tracks that are considered to be off-road uh, cycling, and I guess uh, the two bump tracks in my ward have been added to some long list that will no doubt never be funded by this administration for upgrades. But um, I just want to make the point that um, we've had a lot of feedback as councillors. I know I did, and I presume everybody did, um, about getting the balance right between. Um, off-road cycling and preservation of bushland and in many cases these two things um, are not compatible. Um, I am not sure that council has quite got the balance uh, right um, but I note that yet again in their own wards um, where there were concerns they prioritised removing those areas or minimising those areas with the off-road cycling um, that's allowed um, but that wasn't the case in the, non the blue areas. Parts. <laughs> non-LMP parts of the city, and I, I see Councillor Griffiths nodding his head. Um, you know, I think that just shows, again, that this LMP administration is not interested in, in governing for everyone in the city, and I don't Point believe... Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Adams. I believe that Councillor uh, Johnson is imputing motive, and I ask you to bring it back to the report where it does not mention LMP. Councillor Johnson, can I bring you back, please, to the report before us? And please desist from making comments about other councillors or the administration that aren't uh, relevant to this particular report. Just to be clear, I can't say the LNP council. Is that the direction that you've just said to me? Seriously. Uh, you, Councillor Johnson, I'm asking you to re restrain your remarks. No, it's the, the Shredder Council, council not LNP. <laughs> uh, just, to, just to be clear... This document is a product of this LNP Council. I've never been asked to vote on it. Um, it. It was released in December last year. Didn't come through this council. It just got released by the LNP Council. Guess what? They're oh, LNP boy, members. Point it of order for you, Councillor Adams. Council. I didn't... My concern was council. the imputing motive. Yes. Councillor Councillor Johnson, can you please what? assist from imputing motive? Point of so order. which motive is that? Point of order. Point of order to you, Councillor Sri. Okay, sorry to interrupt, Chair, but I, I wasn't aware that imputing motive would remain a valid point of order in the meetings local law. And if, if it is, I would ask you to define what imputing motive means. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sri. I'm asking the Councillor to come back to the item before us. Well, that's relevance. So is that what you mean? Yes. <laughs> Okay, I, look, anybody watching or listening to this is going to understand exactly the type of bullying that's going on here. I'm clearly talking Point of order, about Mr. the Chair. report. Point of order to you, Councillor Adams. Um, imputing motive in saying that we only govern for our wards. That was my point of order that I asked you to rule on. I am not bullying Councillor Johnson. I am following the meeting's local law. Councillor Johnston. The, the matter before us relates to cycling to off-road cycling strategy. That is, the, the wards in which these uh, uh, bushland areas are contained is irrelevant. Um, please, uh, please, please stick to the matter before us, which is, which is a discussion of the off-road cycling strategy regard and the, the wards in which bushland areas are contained is not relevant to this report. Are you serious? You're telling me that the suburbs <laughs> in Brisbane that the off-road cycling strategy relates to are not relevant to the off-road cycling strategy. Yeah, Let me yeah. be clear. What, the strategy has got that? lists and lists of parks suburbs. Yes. Um, I've read it. Clearly you haven't. But let me be clear, you're now saying that I can't mention the LMP, I can't no. mention wards, <laughs> I can't mention, can I mention suburbs? You can I mention suburbs? Councillor Johnson, okay with you? yes to your question, uh, please, to relevance. Uh, <laughs> suburbs are relevant. Uh, wards aren't contained in this report. Oh, come oh on. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. We represent wards. You do realise that. Yeah. 
Point but this council is sorry, Councillor Shree. Point of order, Chair. Councillor Shree, point of order. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to interject, but I mean, I think what's happened here is that Councillor Adams has taken offence to something. It's resulted in a series of points of order, and you've made the mistake of setting a uh, comically and ridiculously narrow parameter of debate. And I would just urge you to maybe reconsider that because we can't seriously have a situation where you're saying that councillors can't name the LNP or can't refer to ward boundaries or like something's we've gone off tra track here but I would encourage you to just reconsider that last ruling because Councillor Sri I understand what impugning motive is uh and the and the but implication that the decisions are being made for party political purposes that is impugning motive and I've asked Councillor Johnson to come back to the matter before us. Yeah. So, you, 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 so you we can't mention the ALP anymore either, which the Lord Mayor does day in and day out, as does everybody else. Ca Councillor now, Johnson, to clear, you told me this was about relevance. Are you now saying it is about imputing motive? Councillor Johnston, please, that is an irrelevant point of order. I'm asking you to come no, back no, to you, the matter you before No, no, you told us. me it's about relevance and now you're saying it's about imputing motive. I don't understand what you're going on about. The, the this point was a of order raised by Councillor thing about the bloody off-road cycling strategy, and I don't look at Councillor Adams laughing. Good for her. Well, I'll keep her here and speak on every item because you're point just order, doing Mr. her Chair. dirty work. Councillor Johnston, can you please come back to the report before us, which is about the off-road cycling strategy? Uh, and I invite you to continue speaking, please. Well, I would too. But let me be clear, I have been talking about the off-road cycling strategy and um, I just, you're going to look back on this, Mr Chair, and it's just going to reflect so poorly on you. I, I, this is just a joke. Um, I've read the off-road cycling strategy and I note that the LMP have made changes to protect their own wards and they've not made them right across the city in the same way. Now, let me be clear. I don't think that is governing for everybody in the city. That's what I said earlier, and I absolutely believe it. So I am very concerned that this policy has not got the balance right between protecting bushland um, and providing for off-road uh, cycling. Now, I did provide a short submission to um, this process, um, and it was clear to me that the um, original draft, which just pretty much had you riding anywhere you wanted to ride in any park or, or bushland anywhere in the city, was just way out of control. But the LNP's uh, changes... I don't think have struck the balance right between um, cycling opportunities uh, and also protecting bushland. Um, and that is the point that I've been trying to make. And I just don't know why Councillor Adams can't control herself. Um, but let me be clear, Mr Chairman, every time someone mentions the ALP now, I'm going to be raising a point of order. Or the Greens, any of them, because this is just a joke. It's becoming a joke. You need to reflect on what's going on here. Thank you. Any further speakers? Councillor Davis. Well, thank you, Mr Chair, and uh, I'd like to thank all councillors that participated um, in the debate and provided their feedback um, about the off-road cycling strategy. And I have to tell you, Mr Chair, I think it is a good strategy. I think the officers worked extraordinarily hard to mm -hmm. engage the community on an issue that has people with a variety of views. There are people that uh, would prefer that uh, nobody went into our bushland reserves and there are uh, some off-road cyclists that would prefer that they all be completely open. So I think that we've struck a really good balance by providing opportunities for off-road cycling in bushland areas, but also putting in mechanisms to ensure that any future uh, off-road cycling um, facilities that will be in our um, bushland areas must go through a full environmental process. It's embedded in the strategy. It's there for all to see. It disappoints me that Councillor Griffiths has come in and made a bunch of comments when clearly he hasn't read the strategy in fullness. 
taken some advice from some other people. I would say I've met with a number of community groups and I've spoken to them in the environmental space and we've spoken about uh, the refresh of our clean, green and sustainable document that will address some of the issues that he has raised uh, with us today. Um, I think we've got the balance right. I do believe that we can move forward to provide opportunities for off-road cycling uh, for people of all ages and skills, whether it's in our bushland reserves or whether it's in our parks. So with those few words, uh, Mr Chair, can I commend both the off-road cycling strategy and thank uh, Lachlan and, and his team for the enormous amount of effort that they put into this uh, in the three stages, when they first went out to gauge what people's interest was, then by putting the draft strategy together and taking all of that information, Councillor Adaman noted the number of submissions that came through uh, so that we could provide a document uh, that I think tries to strike a very good balance uh, for all stakeholders involved. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of the councillors who took the time to provide their feedback and I look forward to finding that feedback through the consultation process provided by Councillor Griffiths. Here, here. Thank you, Councillor Davis. We now move to the vote on the report. Uh, all in favour of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee report, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed, please say no and raise your hands. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division being called by Councillor Adams and Councillor Cunningham. Please ring the bells. Thank you, councillors. The division is on the Environment, Parks and S Sustainability Committee report. All in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Any opposed, please say no, raise your hands. No. Are there any abstentions? Sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't think my video was on. We need to do that again. Sorry, Deputy Chair. Um, Mr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, the eyes do have it. Uh, the voting being 23 in favour and uh, one against. Thank you, councillors. We now move on to the City Standards Committee report. Councillor Marks. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the report of the City Standards Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 1st of February 2022, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Marks and seconded by Councillor Toomey that the report of the City Standards Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 1st of February 2022, be adopted. Councillor Marks. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Look, before we move to the committee report, I want to just respond to uh, Councillor Johnson's inquiry during question time to the Lord Mayor regarding a small business known as Rage Cage Smash Rooms. So now I can advise that Council has requested the business to provide us with a copy of their certificate of occupancy by the 28th of February to ensure that the site is compliant with building standards. The, the business is also required to get a permit for a venue permit under the Entertainment Venues and Event Local Law 1999. And this permit will deal with the issues around noise, patron health and environmental impact. The business has applied for this permit and council is currently working with the applicant to ensure compliance is met. So while unfortunately this, while it's certainly a unique activity, I am advised that rage cage smash rooms are apparently classified as indoor sports and recreation. And as such, this business is compliant with the city plan zoning and for that area, which is a district centre. However, that being said, council still requires the business to provide a certificate of occupancy in order to ensure it is complying with the building building standards and also a permit under the entertainment and events local law, which they are currently doing. And to echo the Lord Mayor's comments on that, we always, always do um, education first before we go in with the heavy boots. There was another couple of questions there, one that uh, was brought up around um, a, allegedly a mattress um, that had been dumped a leg in. A leg has been sitting there for some time. Um, looking at the photo, what we can see from it, we understand it looks like it's on QR land. I'm happy to be corrected if that's incorrect, but it looks very clearly to me like it's on QR on land. It's not path. on council land. On the footpath. No, not well, not from the photo that I can see. And I think it would be useful if we potentially use the contact centre to log jobs, and then we might be able to get a better understanding of I've where this that. issue is. I that last week. Councillor so Johnson, please. The other the issue answer. that was brought up was about the mowing. Um, and look, can I just say, oh, there was a third question. My apologies. This was about the additional um, mowing contractors moving into extra spaces. So look, what we did, I need to make this very clear, we reached out to our current approved panel of suppliers to determine who had additional um, capacity or capability, and we engaged them for additional assistance on a temporary basis until they can resume. Um, we have also been allocating internal resources on a priority basis, but we are also experiencing the impacts of an Omicron on our internal staff. So on the matter of mowing, I just want to make this very clear. We are aware that there is an issue out there, as are the contractors. They're not doing this on purpose to make everyone's life miserable. And I want to read out a, a, a comment that was put on a social media Facebook post. I'm not going to read who it was directed to, um, but I want to read, and this is coming from a person who says, and I quote, as a person working in this field for the council, um, this doesn't help. We are working six days a week, 10 plus hours a day. We are well aware of the situation and complaints only slow us down and disrupt the process. Anyone can take photos from the ground level to make, to look worse than it is. Um, it goes on to comment another cop couple of comments um, which I'm not going to read out here I would suggest the council who this is directed to knows what those comments are my point here is we are aware there's a situation um, the grass is growing quicker than you can mow it I don't know about you but my own personal house my husband is mowing every week um, and the the guys are out there doing the best they can the contractors are doing the best they can you can go to a supermarket and can't find the meat you want this is all impacted by COVID um, we have a, a, an issue where um, some stages contractors are down by 50 percent in their staff uh, and we are just doing what we can in this space so all I'm doing at, at this point in time is asking you again Please be patient. We are aware of the situation. The officers and the councillors, uh, the sorry, the council contractors are working on the situation. Um, and like I said, they're not doing this on purpose to annoy us. They are really trying to get things out there happening. Last week's committee presentation was on personal appearance services, which was quite interesting. And we then had two petitions, and I'm happy to leave those to debate for the chamber. Further debate. 
Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Just uh, wish to speak on um, Clause C, the petition requesting the Council extend the footpath between 105 and 117 Miskin Street, Toowong, and ask that it be taken seriatim for voting yes, purposes, please. For voting. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. So this, um, res the response to this petition um, is bordering on ridiculous, and I couldn't let this one go by. Um, this is the LNP uh, coming unstuck on their own mistruths that they, they tell to the community. So it's clear the local LNP councillor for the Walter Taylor Ward James Mackay has told residents that he can't do anything about this issue and it's up to the big bad council to, to install footpaths and to do something uh, in this location. Uh, then his own LNP council um, has written back to these petitioners and said, oh, it's actually up to your local councillor, Councillor James Mackay. Uh, so this is, this is farcical. This local councillor... Chair is part of the so-called Shrina Council, as you're all referring to yourselves nowadays. Uh, and what we now see is that the funding for footpaths is so minimal that even LNP councillors are having to tell their own constituents that there is no money for them. There is no money for new footpaths. Sorry, Councillor Cassidy. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Just checking whether you're allowed to mention LNP councillors. Um, Councillor Cassidy, I could ask asking you to come back to the motion before us, please. So out of frustration, Chair, with the incorrect statements made in this petition response, uh, the head petitioner reached out to me and sent me uh, their reply to this petition response. Um, and I'd now uh, like to read this into the record. Uh, and this is from the head petitioner now, and I quote, I recently raised a petition for a sealed footpath in my neighbourhood at Tawong. I previously discussed this footpath with my local councillors, Julian Simmons and now James Mackay. In previous years, I've requested both my councillors to request funding for this footpath from the Safer Paths to Schools uh, program, as the footpath is across the road from Brisbane Boys College and at the back gate of the Queensland Academy for Science, Mathematics and Technology, QASMT. In past years, my local councillor, James Mackay, has advised me he did not want to use his ward budget for this footpath as it would take up a considerable portion of the budget. My councillor has advised me that his request for funding for this footpath from the Safer Paths to School program have been unsuccessful for two years running. It is for this reason I submitted a petition which was supported and circulated by QASMT PNC. I was disappointed to read the background information of my petition from the City Standards Committee incorrectly claiming that all new footpath construction is funded by the evenly distributed Suburban Enhancement Fund distributed to each ward and referring, <coughs> pardon me, and referring the issue back to my local councillor. I've been asking council to construct this missing section of footpath for several years and I'm not pleased to be misinformed by council in regards to the sources of funding available to construct it. If you could please raise this when my petition is discussed in council, I would be grateful. I hope the council will also amend the response to petitioners accordingly. And I'll leave that uh, in the hands of the local councillor for this area, Councillor James Mackay. I'm sure he'd wanna make sure that, um, uh, that he's on the record correctly when it comes to this issue. Uh, and that's where that, um, that email ends, uh, Chair. So the very same, uh, LNP councillor who was caught red-handed using footpaths as his own personal billboards, plastering them with his own name labels, somehow now can't pull together the funding to complete a 65-metre section of footpath next to two schools. Uh, he claims to local residents that there is not enough money in the Suburban Enhancement Fund for Walter Taylor Ward to construct this footpath, uh, and he has is, he is said to them, uh, he said to them that he continues to request of the Lord Mayor this funding, but the Lord Mayor continues to ignore him. So when an LNP councillor can find money for stickers with their names on them and plaster them across footpaths, they can find money for apps that nobody uses and for newsletters to promote themselves, but they can't find enough money to construct a footpath near a school for children to walk on. Uh, there's something seriously wrong with this administration chair. Uh, council has a budget of $3.6 billion and this LNP administration would rather spend every last cent on cost layouts 
and on themselves clearly instead of delivering the most basic services in the community. And this is another example, Chair, of residents continuing to pay more and more in rates and getting less and less in their suburbs. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Oh, yes, thank you. I'll just uh, rise to speak on the petition um, at item B. Um, and this is the uh, petition um, for uh, council to take action on non-compliant businesses impacting on residential amenity in Tennyson. I might just mention um, item A. Um, it's really, it was really interesting last week in um, the presentation on personal appearance services. Uh, and again, Councillor Marks did not answer uh, the question I asked about this too. Um, it was very clear in the presentation to us that council has the power to shut down um, uh, unlicensed um, hairdressers, tattooists, earpieces, etc. cetera. Um, and I did ask her the question about why uh, you couldn't shut down other non-compliant businesses. Um, because as we see with the rage cage, as we see with the um, issues here at Tennyson, years and years pass um, and this council works with non-compliant businesses to try and achieve compliance. Now, in the meantime, the people who are suffering are the residents who are directly and adversely impacted by um, the unauthorised business. Now, in this case, it happens to be two of the largest freight logistics businesses in Australia, Pacific National and Toll. Back in 2011, Council approved an extension to their facilities. And as part of that uh, uh, conditions, Council required them to uh, put into place noise management plans uh, to manage their impacts on the adjoining residential area in Tennyson Ward. Guess what? Neither of those big freight logistics companies uh, did that. So for a decade, they've been operating um, and no one even checked, no one checked. We've raised noise concerns here for many years and more consistently in the last few years um, because uh, the level of activity is significantly increasing. This is a major intermodal yard um, uh, in the back of Tennyson. Um, it, it, this, this just demonstrates to me that everything that's wrong um, with council. Um, it's been several years since council committed, uh, started its investigation. Um, we've made complaint after complaint. Um, council was asked to look at noise and lighting issues. Uh, council, in investigating the noise issues, got the lawyers involved um, and agreed to a nine-month uh, um, hold on legal action. Uh, nine months. So the biggest freight companies in Australia, probably in the world, um, needed nine months after over a decade of non-compliance uh, to try and meet their DA conditions. Now, with all due respect, um, council rolled over in the um, uh, legals here and it should have been firmer about requiring compliance. So unfortunately, we are still waiting on council to assess whether or not these businesses are compliant with their DA conditions. Now, guess what? I suspect it'll come out with, yes, they're compliant. Um, I don't know the outcome of the noise testing. I've not been told. The residents have not been told. Council was asked to do um, a lighting survey. The officers wrote back to me and said they can't do it. So, you know, council couldn't do it. Um, they couldn't even identify where the lights were um, and tried to blame QR when it wasn't QR. It's Toll and Pacific National. Um, this has been botched um, and it is unfortunate that years later we are still trying to get an outcome here and the outcome we are trying to get is to stop the adverse amenity impacts on the adjoining residential area. Obviously, freight uh, logistics are important but it does not mean that they have carte blanche um, to make noise and shine lights into people's houses 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, because that's how they operate. Now, council is due this month 
to provide uh, the outcome of its independent assessment of the uh, compliance report on the DA conditions, and I am awaiting that. I still have heard nothing about the lighting issues, and this council needs to do more. Um, the Lord Mayor um, blithely in question time today says, oh, we work with businesses to try and get them to comply. Well, a decade on, that's not working, that approach. Council needs to do more. It needs to have uh, a stronger backbone when it comes to dealing with businesses that are flouting their development conditions, that have not met their permit or licensing. Um, and it's critically important that residents who live in a low density area um, are not being harassed uh, by noise and light 24 hours a day, 365 days per year. So um, whilst this says I agree with what's going on here, um, I really don't agree with what council has been doing. Um, I am concerned that they have not put enough, um, uh, not, not acted in a timely enough way to make sure this issue is being addressed. Um, and it, it really shouldn't roll on into its second decade before council takes action to stop what are clear breaches of development um, conditions. Uh, and I really don't know whether or not the process uh, here is going to deliver the outcome that the residents want, um, and that is to lower the level of noise and to stop light shining into their homes. I mean, we've had presentation after 14 years I've been on City Standards Committee and it's, it's various guises. And every year there's a presentation on how great council's lighting is and uh, how they can do these nuisance lighting investigations. I mean, council refused to even do one here. Um, council needs to take more action here uh, to address the noise and lighting issues. It can't just sit back uh, as it's done for several years now. It can't just give big businesses nine months to comply with something they should have complied with 11 years ago. Um, you know, they're making millions and millions. These are massively big businesses making billions of dollars probably every year. And they shouldn't be allowed to do so at the expense of residents um, who deserve to be protected by council's planning scheme and enforcement, proper enforcement by council officers. So, um, I mean, finally, there's some movement in the right direction here, but it's taken too long and it council must act. It must protect these residents. It's very clear that there has been non-compliance for over a decade and that needs to stop. Further speakers? No further speakers? Councillor Marks? No. Okay, thank you. We now move the report, the City Standards Committee report. Oh, sorry, we have uh, seriata, my apologies. So we're moving A and B. A and B first of the City Standards Committee report. All in favour of items A and B, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no, raise your hands. The ayes have it. Item C, item C in seriatim, all in favour of item C, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. aye. <clears throat> Any opposed, please say no and raise your hands. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division calls by Councillor Cassidy. Is there a seconder? Yep. Councillor, Councillor Griffiths. Or me, whatever. <laughs> Councillor Strunk, yep. thank you. Okay. Motion's been called. Please ring the bells.
Thank you, councillors. The division is on item C in the City Standards Committee report. All in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. aye. Any opposed, please say no and raise your hands. No. No. Are there any abstentions? Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 17 in favour, four against and one abstention. Thank you declare that motion carried. Councillors, the Committee Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee report, please. Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 1st of February, 2022, be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Howard and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 1st of February 2022 be adopted. Councillor Howard. Well, thank you, Mr Chair. And of course, before moving to the presentation, I do want to update the Chamber on some of the fantastic, fabulous things that have been happening in our beautiful city um, recently. Um, on Friday evening, it was my great pleasure uh, to represent Council at the Pride Football Australia tournament uh, launch. And that was held at the Brunswick Hotel, um, which is just up the road from where I live. So that was fantastic. But what I think is amazing on this is that this was as a result of um, a sponsorship from our Inclusive Brisbane. And it really is an amazing thing that the Pride Football Australia tournament which is an annual event creating strong connections for our LGBTQIA plus players all over Australia. But in 2022, the event is held here in Brisbane with Brisbane Strikers. Really want to thank Brisbane Strikers um, who uh, let the event be held at Perry Park. It was supported by the Brisbane Inferno Football Club, which is the newest uh, member of the Pride Football Australia. And of course, we had Football Queensland supporting it as well. Um, it was a, a fantastic opportunity to talk to um, the, the team from Sydney, who unfortunately won, but, uh, you know, this was our first effort to, at, uh, at participating. So um, it, was a, it was a fantastic evening and it was uh, something I think that um, we should be very proud that Brisbane was able to host that. Uh, the, this was a team that came up from Sydney. The, the uh, team from Melbourne wasn't able to participate and nor was the um, female team that had intended to be there. Um, but to know that we could go ahead and hold that in, in Brisbane was just fantastic. Um, the guys told me that they were looking forward to seeing a great deal of the light nightlife of uh, Brisbane and, and having a really great time. So really want to congratulate um, Pride Football Australia, but also um, our Inferno president, Jake Hendry, for putting the effort into applying for that sponsorship and for uh, Brisbane City Council to be front and foremost of um, assisting this team. They're very much looking forward uh, to continuing um, the growth of that particular club. On Saturday night, we've already heard people talk about um, Briz Asia, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but we also had the Lunar New Year um, in the heart of the valley, and I want to thank Councillor Landers for launching that, and, uh, and, and it was fantastic to walk into the mall and see so many people. Um, so not only was uh, there events in Brunswick Street Mall, there were events in Chinatown, Bakery Lane, um, and some of the other valley locations. We had roving lion dances, and it was a, an, a fantastic opportunity for families to enjoy what, uh, what the valley has to offer. And it was a really um, excellent um, opportunity uh, for, for council to really celebrate something that's really important. And as the Lord Mayor said, a lot of the Lunar New Year celebrations had to either be postponed or cancelled. And so uh, for us to be able to do that safely in um, the Brunswick Street Mall was, was fantastic. Um, at the same time, we were launching the Brisasia 
um, festival in the Fortitude Music Hall. And yet again, how wonderful to celebrate such a fantastic event in the Fortitude Music Hall. Those guys have been doing it so tough since they opened their doors and they are just such um, such great supporters of Brisbane and such a fantastic opportunity to host um, the Brisasia um, event. Really want to um, congratulate Anthony and Jen Garcia from Sounds Across Oceans. This is their first year as a as the producer, and it was an uh, it was an amazing night. And um, I know we talked about it in committee a little bit this morning. And uh, Councillor Cutting was there, as was uh, Councillor Landers and Councillor Hutton and Councillor Toomey. And who did I miss out? And the Lord Mayor, of course, was there. I forgot about you, Lord Mayor. But it was just um, there were so many. It was just great to see so many people enjoying such a diverse, wide-ranging entertainment. And um, as the Lord May mentioned before, there's going to be over 50 events being held in the next couple of weeks. It's just a wonderful opportunity for Brisbane. I really encourage each and every councillor to promote what's happening in your area. There's uh, activities happening at Sunpack. There's activities happening at the Powerhouse, the Museum of Brisbane. It's just, um, it, you know, I'm so proud of what they've achieved and um, I'm really looking forward to, um, to, to seeing that just grow each year um, with our Brisasia Festival. And, and this is, of course, its 10th year. So I know that Councillor Adams was there at the very beginning and, um, you know, there was somewhat of a slow start. I think with Brisasia, people weren't quite sure what it was and um, it has just grown and grown and people love it. So um, I'm just so proud that in its 10th year, uh, we we started with such a, a fantastic um, launch and I'm looking forward to the fashion parade that's going to be on and so many other activities that are happening. And finally, on Sunday, um, I was um, proud to represent council at the, you know, the World Interfaith Harmony Week, which was unanimously adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on the 20th of October 2010. It takes place on the first week of February every year and this year's theme was about living a life of service. It was, um, again, we had to do it by Zoom, but um, it worked magnificently. And we had um, eight faith communities um, talk to us about how their beliefs inspire people to live a life of service. And um, I really want to just um, share with you the the statement that was made, which was, was that religion should be the cause of love and agreement, a bond to unify all mankind, for it is a message of peace and goodwill to man from God. So um, that was uh, that was what's been happening just in the the last week. I'm looking forward to um, updating you on lots of other things that happen in the in the coming weeks. But I do want to talk about our committee presentation. We were thrilled to have our Creative Communities Manager give us an update on the Lord Mayor's Seniors Program for 2021. And uh, I'd, I think I'd actually forgotten some of the things that we had actually achieved in 2021 and, and through a difficult year of COVID. But the programs offered included the Lord Mayor's Seniors Cabaret, the Seniors Month Suburban Concerts and the Lord Mayor's Seniors Christmas Parties. Um, I know just from talking to people from my elect, from my area, just how much they enjoyed each and every one of those events. And uh, the Lord Mayor's Seniors Christmas Party is just such an event that everybody looks forward to. And I know that when the Lord Mayor goes out, everybody is saying thank you, thank you. And it's um, it was great, I think, to see the the videos. And I know that um, every councillor was provided with. Um, the opportunity to have those videos. And could I encourage you maybe to talk to some of your seniors um, uh, facilities that where people can't get out very much to have that entertainment and they might be able to show it in their in their in their um, facilities. And I know that um, some of the facilities that are that are in Central Ward very much look forward to being able to share that with some of their residents that aren't able to to go to the actual um, performance. So um, on that note, I will um, recommend the report to the Chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Howard, are there any further speakers? No further speakers on this report. We'll now move the report. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Raise your hands. Makes it easier. Any opposed, please say no. Raise your hands. 
I declare that carried. Thank you very much, councillors. We now move on to the finance and city and city governance committee report. Councillor Cunningham. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my uh, my video seems a bit intermittent, so bear with me. Um, I move that the report of the Finance and City Governance Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 1st of February, 2022, be adopted. Seconded. Uh, sorry, it's been moved by Councillor Cunningham and seconded by Councillor Huang that the report of the Finance and City Governance Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 1st of February, 2022, be adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As is tradition, our committee presentation at the first week was a regular market and economic update as part of the net borrowings quarterly report. COVID continues to dominate the discussion and impact on domestic and global economic indicators. The global vaccine rollout, the emergence of Omicron and the associated impact that these factors have on GDP growth, global supply chains and inflation were key topics of discussion. Additionally, we had the monthly bank and investment report with the CFO on hand to answer any questions of the committee and I'll leave any other comments to the chamber. Thank you. Is there any debate as suggested? No further debate. Thank you. I'll now put that report, the Finance and City Governance Committee report. All in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Aye. Any opposed, please say no, raise your hands. I declare that motion carried. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Adams. Uh, Mr Chair, I would like to move the procedural motion that debate on the Ash Barty uh, motion last week for the naming of Godiva Avenue Park now be taken off the table for debate. Okay, so Councillor Adams, you're moving a procedural motion to take a motion for um, that a motion that lie on the table be taken off the table. Um, if that's that was a motion that uh, we considered on the first of February, we can pick off from that point where it was asked to lie on the table. Is there a seconder to that motion, Councillor Hutton? So it has been moved by Councillor Adams and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the motion that we that was. Uh, um, put on the table in the first on the first of February now be taken off the table. We can continue debate from that point. Uh, I'm apologies. We have to put that taking it off the table to the vote. Um, I now move that procedural motion for vote. All in favour that this motion be passed, that we uh, take it off the table. Please say aye. Raise aye. your hands. Aye. Any opposed, please say no, raise your hands. Thank you, I declare that carried. We can pick up debate from the point where we finished the debate. Are there any further speakers to this motion? Councillor Landers. Thank you, Chair. As discussed last week, the Deputy Mayor has been in discussions with Tennis Queensland with regards to the recognition for Ash Barty's outstanding achievements. Team Barty have been contacted and they have thanked us for the offer, um, but would like to decline at this time until Ash has finished her career. This mm. is totally understandable and reflects the humble nature of this truly remarkable athlete. Obviously, we wish her a long and successful career to rival the efforts of Raphael Nadal. But at this time, Future discussions will be, um, hopefully, a long time in the future. So we will not be supporting this motion. Thank you. Any, any other speakers? No other speakers? Councillor Johnston, you can sum up. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I note the language that Councillor Sandy Landers just used there, which is that somehow this was their initiative. Um, now, what happened last week was one of the most disgraceful displays of this LNP council that I've ever seen in action. 
um, about an hour after I moved this motion, um, the Lord Mayor went out publicly saying, what should we name after Ash Barty? All over his social media, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. Um, clearly, that was to counter the reputational damage that they did to themselves as part of this debate. And again, here today, you would think that Councillor Sandy Landers has had something to do with this. Um, now, I wrote to Queensland Tennis um, well over a week ago and to the Premier and to um, uh, Ash's uh, federal member. And I did receive an email from them um, earlier today. I'd be really interested about when Councillor Adams uh, wrote to Queensland Tennis and I might do a file request and just check um, when that was because um, the way in which... Um, Councillor Adams and Councillor Landers are trying to make out that somehow they've been doing this consultation um, is just wrong. So I received an email from uh, Elia, Elia Hill from the head of tennis delivery today. And clearly it's the same email that Councillor Landers has got. Um, she's not included in this email. Um, we have spoken to the Barty team and they've asked that this tribute be declined until Ash finishes her playing career. So um, as the motion says, this was always subject to Miss Barty's uh, support. Um, I note that uh, it's not something that she wants to do at this time, which I know will be disappointing to our community. Um, because if you look on my Facebook page um, from last, uh, last Monday, um, you know, this is something that our community really supports. Uh, uh, but absolutely it needs to be uh, done at the request of the person. We wouldn't want to name anything uh, after somebody who chooses not to. Um, my feeling with all of this is that um, Ash Barty is a very humble person and I don't think she, she realises necessarily um, the power of her name being in our public places and what that does for young women um, and young sportswomen around Queensland. Um, we just don't have enough public places um, named and, and facilities named after women. Um, and I, I think that, you know, it would be something um, really important to consider, um, uh, you know, and something that I hope that she will reconsider because, you know, I hope she plays on for another decade, um, but I, I don't really think, you know, um, that that should mean we can't name a park after her. So, and I flag I'll need a seconder for this. Um, I move that the motion is withdrawn. Seconded, Chair. Yep. Thank you, councillors. Uh, we've received a procedural motion that the motion be withdrawn. All in favour of that motion, please say aye. Raise your hands. Aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Raise your hands. The motion is withdrawn. Thank you. We now move on to petitions. Councillors, um, are there any petitions to present to council today? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I'm tabling a petition electronically asking for council to take action on the rage cage at uh, Corinda. Thank you. Any further petitions? No further petitions. Can we have a motion, please, for receipt of that petition? Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Seconded. Been moved by Councillor Landers and seconded by Councillor Griffiths that the petition as presented be received and referred to the Committee Concerned for Consideration and Report. All in favour, please say aye. Aye. Raise your hands. Any opposed, please say no. Raise your hands. The ayes have it. Councillors, general business, um, are there any statements required as a result of an Office of the Independent Assessor or Councillor Ethics Committee order? Nobody raising their hands. Councillors, are there any matters of general business? 
Yes. Councillor, Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. <clears throat> I wish to speak tonight on a few issues. First of all, my concern um, about a an announcement the member for Lilly made about a $500 million pledge um, to fix Gympie Road once and for all. Um, I'll also be discussing, um, of course, the Band-Aid busway as part of this um, debate and also, if I have time, to speak about Danny Walker, an outstanding resident um, and pres football president in the Marchant Ward. Mr Chair, the reason why I'm speaking this evening about this is the member for Lilly announced a $5 million um, pledge for the next election that will fix Skimpy Road. I just wanted to bring a couple of things to the Chamber's attention. Um, I welcome Gympie Road being fixed. And before I go on, because I know those opposite will say that I'm against public transport, which can be further from the truth. I support loudly and proudly affordable, reliable public transport. Ever use it? The, the Band-Aid... Yes, I do, <laughs> Councillor Cummings. Um, the Band-Aid busway... Um, has already had a blown, blowout of over um, $20 million from when it was first announced in October 2020. Now, I would like to explain a little bit more about this project. Um, we know the real issue is not that 2.5 kilometres of road. We know that. Point, and of, order, we... Point of order, Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, just uh, just concerned that Councillor Hammer might be um, misleading the chamber. I think the metro's had a three hundred million dollar cost blowout. She said twenty million uh, just then. Uh, I'm not sure that's a correct point of order, Councillor Cassidy. Councillor I, Hammond, please. I expect nothing else from the leader of the opposition. This is over a twenty that's million dollar blowout. Yes, you can always expect that. Councillor Strunk, please. A two point five kil kilometre road. Now I attended all of the public consultation meetings, and I will note that the two Palaszczuk governments, because Councillor Johnson has a problem if I say ALP, so the two Palaszczuk um, rep state representatives did no, not... No, I don't. The, the chairperson does. So, so I want to say the 6.5-minute improvement time that they say on their documents is actually a figure I made up at one of the meetings that the, the state government are now using as fact the 6.5 because they can't prove that it's a 6.5 saving time in this area. Now, I've done, well, despite that, they're narrowing the lanes down to 3.1 metres each, which is going to cause those double bang of trucks and everything else to drive really close together. Some of their wing mirrors are actually wider than the 1.5 metres that the lanes are proposed. Um, this also has effect on small business, and I will note that some of these changes were made, which the businesses are quite happy. Um, not ecstatic, but happy that they were a little about listened to. It also has effect on our residents of how they get in and out of their local streets. But let me get back to my calculations on this. With just rough calculations, the 2.5 kilometre of road that is the Band-Aid busway is costing about $304,000 per metre. $304,000 per metre. So this brings me back to the member for Lily and her announcement. Again, all four her to come in and help her state Labor colleagues. But $5 million on those calculations that the state government are doing for the Band-Aid busway, that would fix, again, rough estimates, this would fix 16 metres of road on Gympie Road. So for the state member of Lilly, how are you fixing the Gympie Road problem when the Gympie Road problem is from Kedron all the way out to past Castledine? 16 metres is just not going to cut it. I wish she had spoken um, to the <laughs> Do Nothing Bart or the state member for Stafford, because both of those gentlemen refused to meet with me about crucial um, state government council projects. Point of order, In yeah. fact... Point of order, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, previously, you um, have instructed councillors to refer to uh, members of parliament using their appropriate title. I don't believe Councillor Hammond uh, did there referring to the member for Aspley. 
yes, you're right, Councillor Cassidy. Councillor Hammond, can I ask you to uh, refer to, to all elected officials by their correct titles? So I know the state member for Aspley refuses to meet with me. In fact, it's not even worth asking because he has actually said to community groups that he would not support them or turn up to their events if they invited myself to attend and support the community groups. As for the state member for Stafford, I have requested over 10 times for a meeting with the state member for Stafford. Has he even bothered to respond to those requests? No, he has not. I've asked him in person and over 10 times in writing um, for a meeting. But that shouldn't be surprising because it took Minister Miles 11 months to respond to correspondence that he has, um, that my office put through with monthly requests for a response, 11 months to respond. This is just not good enough. I wait with bated breath to hear what the federal member for Lily comes up with on how she is going to fix Gympie Road for $5 million. I presume you Northsiders will know what I'm saying. I presume there's going to be a Tim Tam in that announcement. I'd like to end on a positive note as usual. I would like to acknowledge the hard work that Danny Walker has done for our community. He was acknowledged in the Australian Day Awards, which of course are postponed during the COVID, um, for his dedication to the sport of rugby league. Danny Walker has been the longest serving president of this wonderful club, the Diehards. He has been a president for 11 years. And I congratulate Danny for his dedication. Danny, there is not a time that I'm at the football club, which is a lot, that you aren't there supervising, getting the fields ready, looking after the top field that council are investing half a million dollars in um, regenerating for, for the hardworking club. Your greens are the best, I would say, in the whole of Brisbane. Congratulations to all your team. Danny, if it's not just you there, it's a family affair. Your son, James, is often found in the canteen or behind the bar supervising and making sure that this club continues to go forward in leaps and bounds. I am yeah. sorry to hear that you have stood down as president this year, but I know that you are going to be there because you live and breathe the diehards. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Strunk. Uh, yes, thanks, Chair. Uh, I want to speak on two items tonight or this afternoon. Uh, one's a uh, brick bat and uh, one's a bouquet. Uh, in regards to the brick bat, um, I know that the... Um, conversation uh, Councillor Marks was having in her address in regard to the grass cutting uh, across Brisbane. And uh, I, I think, I think uh, the, the issue is, um, uh, in my ward anyways, and, uh, and, I, and I have a sneak suspicion it was in a couple of wards near me, that it was really, it wasn't the COVID issue, um, but it was a, really a management issue in regards to the um, uh, the grass cutting that was not taking place since the middle of November, well before the Omicron showed up uh, in any substantive way. Um, I had parks that were, I've had two parks up in, in a Creekwood village that had not been cut or even gone near since mid-November. And as you can imagine how high that grass is, so I think it's a bit of a furphy, this thing about COVID. Um, and if you have a look at the results of the uh, question that we asked in regards to complaints in the, uh, on the agenda today, you only have to uh, go through it to see where uh, the crews have been doing a great job across Brisbane and where some of the crews have not been doing a very good job managing the uh, grass growth. Uh, yes, there's been a lot of rain. And we all know that. Yes, I've had my, uh, have to cut my grass fairly often as well. But really, when you have neglect, especially in the parks, quite frankly, and those are the things that we want people to use, especially during COVID, for goodness sakes. Uh, and, it, and it came down to the stage in um, a couple of our parks where actually residents went out and cut 
pathways into the parks so that the kids could actually use the play equipment and uh, and the uh, and the and the residents use the uh, uh, the uh, uh, gazebos and other uh, infrastructure. Um, I actually visited one of those uh, crews uh, from the local residents around uh, last uh, or the Sunday before last, and uh, and thank them very much for uh, taking this work up. Um, and I say, and I say, really, um, it's really sad when, uh, especially a particular suburb or or a ward for that matter, um, gets neglected this way because uh, you only have to look at the um, the complaints uh, figures here, where Forest Lake, as a suburb, uh, had 163 complaints, and the next closest one was 89 complaints at Carindale. So. Don't know what's going on. I think there's got to be better oversight as to uh, what's going on in some of these park from a management point of view, because certainly um, the uh, yes, there's been a lot of growth uh, due to the rain. But why do all these other crews seem to be able to cope uh, with COVID and with the extra rain and everything, and uh, and get and and get very few complaints for for that uh, for that good work. Uh, and uh, some areas uh, are impacted uh, much greater. So I encourage Council Marks to have a, a look at the uh, at the um, the contractors that are doing these areas and uh, have a uh, have a discussion with them uh, as to how improve how they can improve. Now, in regards to the bouquet, um, we uh, had a bit of an anniversary uh, last Sunday uh, down at the uh, Lake Stage. The uh, jazz uh, tr uh, trio who have been entertaining. Uh, my residence uh, in in the in the ward now for exactly 12 months, uh, which is a terrific uh, achievement uh, for this small uh, uh, um, um, trio of, uh, of professional musician professional musicians um, who uh, undertook and uh, came and saw me 12 a bit over 12 months ago and said, "Listen, we'd like to uh, we'd like to um, be able to." Uh, entertain down at the lake stage. Um, do you think that's a thing that you can help us uh, maybe give us a bit of funding? And I said, well, let's see how things work out. And uh, quite frankly, you know, they've been doing this on a fortnightly basis. And um, and also they they suggested that maybe we should have a look at a bit of a sound system for the stage, which has now been installed. So uh, uh, the stage is now wired for sound. And uh, so we'll... Um, well, it, it, it's not going to support a big uh, heavy metal group or anything like that. But for a small trio, I think the um, the sound system now that's now built into the stage uh, will be a great asset for any for this trio and anyone else coming along uh, that may may want to have a uh, a small uh, a small event. Uh, um, which, which of course, you can't really do a huge event in front of the lake stage. Uh, no, probably no more than about three or four hundred people at the at the very most. So I just want to finish off with a, a positive note uh, to say that um, if if you got some time and you're anywhere near uh, Forest Lake on a Sunday, the first of the first of the third Sunday um, uh, of of a month uh, from uh, two thirty in the winter, from about three from about three o'clock in the summer, stop in and uh, be entertained with for about three hours with uh, some great tunes. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Strunk. Further speakers in general business? Councillor Atwood. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to speak tonight on Ocean Crusaders. Last week, the Deputy Mayor, the Mayor and myself had the absolute pleasure to go and meet Jeff. Now, Jeff is not one of my residents and from Tingalpa. He's actually Brisbane's newest river cleaner and it was really great to see him in action. Uh, Jeff is really important, sorry, Jeff is really needed on our city's uh, river because over the last three years, Ocean Crusaders have removed um, about 23 tonne from the Ramsar wetlands, 29 tonne from Balimba Creek, 19 tonne from St Helena Island, and it goes on and on. Unfortunately, we do have a phenomenal amount of rubbish that has added up over the years. So Jeff is a prototype that will pick up rubbish as it is floating downstream. Um, Ocean Crusaders have a vision to install 10 along the Brisbane River, starting in West End, um, along South Bank, um, New Farm, all down the river to pick it up as it does come down so it doesn't go into the mangroves 
um, and out to the bay. We do not want it out there. So it is a terrific prototype. It will also help the volunteers. I know they have hundreds of volunteers who go out and help. Um, it's back-breaking work. I can confirm I've done it a few times and I know the Mayor and Councillor Alan joined me on one. We picked up massive logs, um, bits of debris actually from the 2011 floods. So I know firsthand that all of their volunteers would also sincerely appreciate these river cleaners to stop the rubbish from getting out onto the bay. So I would like to encourage every councillor, if you've never reached out to Ocean Crusaders, please do. Um, they are a phenomenal not-for-profit and I really look forward to continuing to work with them um, and seeing how we can work together to improve our beautiful Brisbane River. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Atwood. Further speakers, Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I wish to speak in relation to a friend of mine who received an Order of Australia Medal on the recent Australia Day Honours List. Uh, that person was Desmond Graham Lawson, innovator and organiser extraordinaire of community events and an innovator in business as well. Des is 73 and turned 74 on the 13th of February. Des lives on the Esplanade at Loder with his wife Rhonda in Winter Manly Ward. Des's award was for community service. He's been my right-hand man for the organisation of the Winter Manly Australia Day Breakfast for over 20 years. Des was the foundation organiser of the Kite Festival at the Murray Recreation Reserve, as well as he organised the Christmas carols at Wakerley uh, when they moved from a church premises to the Diantha Street Park. As such, Des's skills and ability to attract volunteers to assist him spread beyond Winter Manly Ward into Doughboy Ward and then into what is now Chandler Ward. Des is also a prominent Rotarian and was District Governor in 2004-2005 for District 9630, which extends from Brisbane to St George. In Rotary, Des has been involved with the Rotary Down Under Board as a member and chair overseeing the National Rotary Magazine and merchandise sales. He is also a member of the Australian Rotary Health Board, which provides grants in the area of mental health and, and is a Rotary Ambassador for Peace. Des set up Dream Cricket at Darling Point Special School to give disabled children a cricket experience. Des established the Port of Brisbane Rotary Club, which has punched above its weight for the last decade or so. Des has received the Rotary International Service Above Self Award and Paul Harris Fellowship. In 2021, he received the Scope Club of Wynnum's Volunteer of the Year Award, which is a prestigious local award in the Wynnum Manly area. Several years ago, he was diagnosed with a terminal illness, but when and underwent uh, experimental treatment, which thankfully has led to him being given the all clear. Congratulations, Des, on a well-deserved OAM. Best wishes to you for many more years of volunteering, business success, and good health. Thank you, Councillor Cumming. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Toomey. Uh, thank you, Chair. I rise to uh, speak today on uh, Run Army. Uh, run Army is a, an event that has uh, run its first run. It was held on the Inogra Army base and was only open to service personnel uh, for the very first time. Uh, as by chance, I happened to meet Brigadier Jake Elwood at the outgoing ceremony for uh, His Excellency um, Paul de Jersey. And Jake invited me on base um, to talk specifically about Run Army and what that would do and look like for the city. Run Army itself is an optional five or 10K running event that runs either through the CBD or up over the Story Bridge. It's actually a running festival uh, based on the running event uh, that the Marines have in, in uh, Washington, DC. So the festival will entail uh, a mix of service personnel, um, families and the general public running around the city. Every kilometre there will be uh, stations uh, manned by service personnel um, where residents, family members can stop and have a chat to, um, to the service personnel. Uh, the, the funding uh, for all of this, or sorry, I should say, the beneficiary of this is Brisbane Legacy. So all funds raised as part of Run Army uh, will go to Legacy Brisbane and specifically to their new facilities um, down at Green Slopes. Um, with that, I would like to invite all councillors to participate 
in the Run Army event. I must say, since I have uh, gotten involved, and I want to thank Jake uh, for getting me involved, I've got my own run team, and I'd like to give a bit of a shout out uh, to my run team because we're running, well, we're basically doing 5Ks on every run, and we're doing that three days a week. So we are rocking up the kilometres. But I want to give a shout out to uh, Penny Benjamin, uh, Caitlin Nevins, and Miranda Scroop, who is probably the best uh, UQ rugby winger that's ever heckled me from the field. So a big shout out to her. Uh, and also James Gottley and Trent Wiseman. Um, I also want to give a special shout out to uh, Lachlan Stewart, uh, who has been providing me and some of the other members of the team with motivation to, to keep going. Um, Lachlan is running a program called The Man That Can Project, and it invites uh, men to come and push themselves outside their boundaries uh, to achieve their goals. Uh, it's a fantastic program, and I think uh, Lachlan deserves a lot of support for what he's doing. Um, the event itself will be held on the 24th of April, so the day before Anzac Day, uh, and it is designed to engage uh, service personnel with members of Brisbane. We are a garrison town, and for that, we have a lot of heritage that is tied to the Inogra Barracks and the other levels of uh, military service. So I really want to encourage all members of the public or councillors in this space uh, to participate in Run Army. I'd like to thank uh, my run team for, number one, getting me fit, number two, getting me up at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, they're doing a great job uh, at, um, keeping me honest and keeping me fit. And I also want to thank Lachlan for being the little voice that's inside my head that tells me to keep running. So thank you. Uh, please get involved in Run Army. It's a great event. All funds raised will go to Legacy Brisbane um, to support their new facility down at Green Slopes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Toomey. Further speakers in general business? Any further speakers? Councillor Owen, I see your hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I rise to speak tonight um, in regards to um, our local multicultural community groups. And firstly, could I say for the Lunar New Year, Gong Shi Fa Tai, Xin Yen Kwai Le, and for the Vietnamese community, Chuk Mun Nam Moi. Um, it is always wonderful to reflect on the diversity that I have in my ward, and we have people from so many different places. But in particular today, I would like to put on the record Sincere thanks for the efforts of the Taiwanese community because um, this week they have been doing something that they've not gone out to seek publicity for it, but it is a real demonstration of their compassion, their caring and their support of the many frontline medical workers at our hospitals. So I know that Councillor Huang and Councillor Marks are also um, joining them tomorrow as well when they present um, the multiple uh, bento boxes for lunches. That So they started off on Monday and on Monday they delivered these lunch boxes to the Princess Alexandra Hospital. Uh, yesterday, uh, sorry, yesterday was um, Princess Alexandra Hospital. Today it was Logan Hospital. Tomorrow it is QE2 Hospital. And on Thursday, it is the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. So they have gone out, they are packing all of these lunch boxes, um, providing them to the hospitals for their staff who are on the front line day in, day out. And I know that many of those staff have been working extra shifts, extraordinary long hours, and certainly putting themselves in the front line for the benefit of the wider community. And they really take their role as public health professionals very seriously. And this is just a way that our multicultural community groups are really standing up and saying, we value your work. And I think that that is something that is truly worthy of putting on the public record in this place tonight, because we do value the work of all the frontline personnel, whether they're emergency service personnel, health professionals working in our hospitals. But importantly, we also value the works of the community groups and the volunteers who willingly get behind these frontline workers and show their support and compassion. So I would like to say to the um, Queensland Federation of Taiwanese Associations, 
a very big thank you for coordinating this along with um, the uh, Director General of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office, Edward Tao. They do a fantastic job. They're always contributing and giving back to our city and our, our people of our city. So a very, very big thank you to, to those volunteers that are supporting our frontline health workers tomorrow and through this week, but importantly as well, to everybody working in those hospitals and on the front line. Thank you for your service to our city, our state and our nation. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Any further speakers in general business? No further speakers. I declare the meeting closed. Thank you.